So I would like to call the South Burlington City Council meeting of Monday, December 19th, 2022 to order. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And Tom, you want to read that off, please? This conference will now be recorded. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, instructions on um, exiting the building in case of an emergency. Great, thank you. Um, for those of you in the room, thanks for being here. If there's an emergency, you can go out either door at the rear of the auditorium and then to the right or left to leave. Um, for those participating remotely, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, If you are interested in speaking on an issue um, on the agenda, please either turn your cameras on and indicate you'd like to speak or um, you can chat to me and the chair will call on you. Um, we are not monitoring the chat for content. Thank you. And Jordan, we can't see the go to meeting on the monitors. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Go. Hey, Noah or Linda, can you guys confirm or Gabe that you or Sue that you can hear us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Hi, thanks, Sue. Yes, indeed. All righty. Okay, so we'll move on to item three, agenda review. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes in order of um, agenda items? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. Are there any in the audience in the auditorium? All right, how about online? Okay, we must be doing things right, right? Um, <laughs> number five is the counselor's announcements and reports on committee assignments and then the city manager's report. Did you wanna to start, Tom? I really just have one thing. Uh, at the last council meeting when uh, Rec and Parks was presenting, they had a lovely photo of Juna Bryland and I stated that it is part of South Burlington. I just wanted a very, very intelligent, smart friend of mine reached out to me and clarified that it is actually a state gore and that the South Burlington never actually annexed to the property when we could have back in 1950. But Wikipedia states that it is part of South Burlington and our legislative district, Chittenden 12, very explicitly, Martin Lalonde's district, very explicitly includes Juniper Island as well as that little rock outpost. I'm claiming it for South Burlington. <laughs> I'm gonna go out and put a flag on it. Juniper Island, South Burlington, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> All righty. Uh, uh, Megan. Yeah, Naki might have something to say about that island and the rocky outpost, too. But, <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank the staff and the volunteers. Tim was out there two nights. I saw Peter Taylor here a lot, as well as Maida Townsend um, and Helen, of course. And I'm sure there are others I'm just talking about when I was around. But it was a wonderful Illuminate Vermont event. And I'm so glad to see the numbers. I'm going to let Jesse, you know, break that news. But it was just wonderful. So thank you, staff. I think our Indeed. residents really appreciated it. Okay. Tim? Sure, thank you. Um, I did attend two meetings last week, uh, one with the Economic Development Meeting and then also the Energy Committee. And uh, there was a lot of discussion over the questions asked by the Planning Commission about uh, updates to the comp plan. So that will generate a lot of discussion and information for the future. Um, I also volunteered two nights at Illuminate Vermont. Had a great time. Saw a lot of from my friends that attended. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I uh, was a traffic control person uh, on the Hinesburg Road side and unfortunately had to give the bad news to many people who didn't read the signs that they had to turn around. Because there was no, there is no way to get through there. <laughs> All right, just want to go to the Blue Mall. Just want to go to the U Mall. Sorry, got to turn around. So, but some people were like, "Well, what's going on?" I go, "Well, there's this, you know, festivity going on. Just go around back and park." And they actually did. And I think they, and they left later. So they were like, "Thanks for letting us know." So, so I just want to thank the staff as well. And it was a fun thing to work, and it was great to be there. And the weather, despite the snow, actually the snow kind of made it nicer. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah. it was it was fun, and it wasn't too cold. So thank you. Right. Okay. Um, I also worked um, the, um, what do you call it? 
s'mores. The s'mores was... bar. So that was it was really cool. The way that it was set up and it was came in waves and it was pretty popular. So that was fun and people appreciated that it was free. Um, I want to just really publicly acknowledge the um, financial support that the Burlington Airport, International Airport, gave, um, along with the Larkin family. They were the two, I think, in the state, I guess we went for a grant, were the, uh, the three big supporters for Illuminate Vermont. And I really appreciate that. I think that's mm -hmm. reflective of um, some of our good relationships with people who um, live here or an airport that lives here, but we don't really control it, but they do reach out and support us um, on occasion. They want, actually, Nick Longo told me he really, really wanted fireworks, but there's no place here um, right now with all the building with um, fireworks. So, But I did have um, a busy week last week. I had a planning committee, um, and I think our new newest... Um, appointee, um, Donna Laban, added um, just some great context to their conversations. So I think that was a really good selection on our part, so we can all pat ourselves on the back. And I think they appreciated that um, kind of different or additional viewpoint. So, so that was good. Um, then I also went to the Charter Committee on Wednesday and answered questions about Oh, my role as chair and thoughts um, about expanding the, the council and having whether we needed a mayor or not. So that is a committee that's very engaged and um, asks good questions. So that was fun. Um, and then on Thursday, I went to a wonderful meeting that Maida Townsend had invited quite a few um, different leaders in South Burlington. It was the Vermont Family Network. And it was really to let, I think probably lots of you are familiar with the organization. If not, I'll get you there. <laughs> but it's a wonderful organization that really provides support to families um, who have children or individuals with um, disabilities or, or health concerns. And that was interesting. And then later that day, since... Um, our fearless leader to my right um, was tied up. I represented the city at the groundbreaking ceremony um, with the um, UVM Medical Center, um, as well as Snyder um, Braverman, to um, talk about their new building, one of their two new buildings, but this one in particular is the one that has 121 units of, um, uh, it's market rate, but I think they're going to subsidize them or help them. It, it's sort of aimed at the uh, people who come to work at the, unit, the medical center and really can't find affordable housing. And then the, you know, topping, uh, the cherry on top is that it also includes a daycare center for, with 75 slots from infants up to, I think it's five, maybe, six. Um, but that was really wonderful to see that sort of coming together of um, the medical center's vision and need for housing as well as daycare and um, the way it supports and will help us develop city center. Mm -hmm. So that was a nice um, event. Let's see, what else did I do? Oh, and I, I worked to illuminate. I think that's it. So it was a busy week, but it was a fun week. And I think, um, you know, the city really has so much going for it when you think about all the different things. Just standing there and looking around um, city center and seeing all those buildings and what used to be a, a racetrack um, and sort of a wetlands that was polluting the pot potash. Um, it, it's really come a long way, baby, as they say. And it was really gratifying to see all the different buildings kind of started by our vision for the city hall and library and then just building from that. Mm -hmm. So it's a good week. Um, 
Jesse. Great. I agree. It was a great week last week. Um, <clears throat> so yes, just to start with Illuminate Vermont. Um, thrilled to share that on Friday night when I when all the staff was a little anxious about were people going to show up to this thing in a snowstorm we had 750 visitors on sat on Friday night and then another 1600 on Saturday so when you think about the for a first year event that um, penetration into the community bring our neighbors out is pretty great um, I do also want to thank all the volunteers all of you a lot of our committee members participated as volunteers which was really exciting um, but I do specifically want to call out the grant we got from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, too. I think without that initial seed funding, it would have been very hard to leverage the rest of the funding. So it's a really great example of how just a little bit of state one-time money can really catapult forward community connections and community resiliency. Um, so thank you to our ACCD partners. I also want to give a huge shout out. You'll hear much more from them tonight, but to the public works crews who did a huge amount to clear snow and keep that a really manageable space while also clearing snow in the rest of the city. Um, I got to do a plow truck ride along Friday night, which was also really <laughs> fun. Um, and then just a huge, huge thanks to Holly and Alana who put so much time and effort and vision into every single tiny little detail of Illuminate Vermont. Um, Alana will be here later on and just huge thanks to them for the masterminding and for all the uh, staff who came out. Um, a couple of other updates for you tonight. Um, on the celebratory front, um, Chief Burke was on Vermont Edition last week. They did a two-day segment on uh, crime and policing in, in Chittenden County, and he and Chief Murad uh, shared the mic on the second day. Um, I'd really encourage folks to listen to that podcast. Um, it's a really interesting conversation about um, the kind of uptick in crime we're seeing, but also how we address that as neighbors and community members without necessarily requiring badges and guns. So really great conversation and thanks to Chief Burke for uh, representing us so well. Um, we had a, several members of the leadership team and I had a meeting with our incoming state delegation this morning to just a meet and greet, develop some relationships, talk to them about some um, municipal operations policies that we see moving forward in Montpelier. Um, it was a great um, our discussion and I think really built those connections that that will benefit all of us hopefully over the um, session um, on a few other kind of municipal logistics um, points uh, the council obviously knows this but just as a reminder to the community the heating and hot water service ordinance goes into effect as of February 15th um, we have that ordinance is obviously online. We have also um, updated our certificate of compliance form that is online and available for developers. Um, and we are working on a series of FAQs for folks who are um, looking to build new in the upcoming months. Um, at your January meeting, I will be asking you to appoint a building inspector, which is part of that enforcement of that ordinance as well. Um, council received a brief update from me on this tonight, but just to share with uh, you all in the community again, um, Colchester has indicated that they are um, not going to move forward with Chittenden County Public Safety Authority this year, uh, which and likely only with fire and EMS in the future, which creates quite a um, financial barrier for us uh, getting that over the um, finish line this year. So we met as a CCPSA board this morning. Uh, we're looking, South Burlington is going to explore how we, with the support of the CCPSA board, how we um, approach funders to think about reallocating some of the grant dollars we, we've received for CCPSA to South Burlington so we can start providing regional services. That obviously will have to come to the council ultimately, so much more to come on that, but I um, did want to share that as it was in public meeting this morning. Um, we have a bunch of exciting things happening in early January with staffing. We have our new HR director starting. She'll come to council and meet with you. We also have two new firefighters and three new police officers starting in January. The, the police officers, of course, to go to the February Academy, which is great. Um, I do want to call out three quick things on your consent agenda um, before you get there. Um, one, the with the November vote, um, the... Uh, several communities in Chittenden County have stood up a uh, Chittenden County Communications Union District. Um, that now has to officially form and write bylaws and uh, convene a board and do all of those initial um, 
table setting things. So I am re respectfully requesting that you appoint me to serve as the South Burlington rep to that board only initially. Once those bylaws are set up, I, I suggest that we go to the community and see if there's a community rep who would like to represent you in the county for that. Um, also want to thank the public works team. There's three different grant applications on your consent agenda, really trying to leverage those uh, state dollars and federal dollars into our community. And then finally, just appending your approval, thanks to Donna Kinville for stepping up to serve as our assistant treasurer during all of our staff transitions. And that's all I've got. Thanks. Great. Okay, so the next item is the consent agenda. And there's two, four, six, eight, ten items, which is a lot. It's a lot. Disbursements, minutes from... Four meetings are November financials, the 2022 grand list errors and omissions list, appointing officially, I guess, Donna Lieban to the um, Planning Commission for a term expiring June 2025, appointing Jesse Baker to serve as the initial representative to the Chittenden County Communications Union District Board, approving applications for a um, Vermont Transportation Alternatives Grant um, for scoping and design and construction of the Allen Road Shared Use Path, approving an application for a Vermont Transportation Alternatives Grant to design, to design and construct the Bartlett Bay Road Culvert Replacement Project. That was quite a long report. Whoa. It kept going. I bet it was 35 pages. There should be a test. Yeah, yeah, well, I will pass. Um, and then approving an application for a reallocation of the 2020 Homeland Security Grant for security cameras at the wastewater facilities. And finally, appointing Donna Kinville to serve as the assistant treasurer. So I'll move to approve, but I have two items. That I okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. And I have an item, too, maybe to roll. Okay, this. so what's yeah. your item? Well, the f items. Yeah, December 5th, and I'm sorry, December is always so busy, Sue, but I caught a couple of things on page four and page six of December 5th. Um, instead of a 575% increase <laughs> on taxes, it should be 5.75. That's, that's on page one. six. <laughs> um, that's in the next to last paragraph. And then on page, so let's all take a deep breath. <laughs> And then page six, instead of um, energy issues, it should be emerging issues, but just at the bottom there. And then that's all good. Um, the question I have is for Martha, just to know that you visited these properties to confirm that there was no structure. And, okay, that was all. Okay. Tim. And also a question for Martha about... Um, the uh, structures on John Fay Road. I, I don't understand how, so these are rental apartments that are being converted to condos. And then, well, so you have, hmm. so you're, you're, you're showing that you're reducing the grand list by roughly $3 million. 3.9 million, yeah. But the condos, when they're purchased, are gonna be, they're gonna have value. Is, is, how do you, you, do you, you want to come up? Can you come up and turn the mic on? Sorry. The condos have value now in the grand list. Okay, okay. So they're already there and you're subtracting the, the rental. Okay, got it. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and yes, I did go out and look at the properties. Okay, that was great. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? You ready for the vote? All those in favor of um, the consent agenda as approved and slightly amended, signify by saying aye. 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 So that carries. And we'll move on to item seven, which is the FY24 budget. And we're going to hear from Dom, Tom DiPietro on the public works presentation, um, which will also include pennies for penny for paths and improvements to the no to the, and, and the open space fund so while tom is setting up here i just um 
this is a really exciting budget night, both community development and public works. There's a lot of public works uh, team members here in the audience, so I'm, I'm sure Tom is going to introduce them. Um, I just want to remind the council and the public that all of our FY24 um, budget documents are on our website. If you go to the city's website, the finance department page, and then the FY24 budget, all of the line item budgets, roll up budgets, presentations are all there for your uh, perusal. And of course, for the council, um, this is this is really an opportunity for you to hear from um, our leaders and ask questions, but also this will become your budget. So if there are things you want to change or see or add or different analysis you want us to look at, we're, we're happy to take that during any time during these budget hearings. Hi, Tom. Hello. Good evening, Welcome. everybody. Hi there. Uh, so Tom DiPietro, Director of Public Works. Uh, I'm going to introduce the rest of the team shortly here, but I'll... Uh, I guess let me start with that, and I'm just going to go to my first slide to do it. So uh, we have 39 employees in public works. We make up about 40% of the expenditures that are in the FY24 budget when you add in the enterprise funds. Um, and so here's a very quick overview of our staff. Um, and I'll start with our director or deputy director of operations, Adam Kate, who's joining us online this evening. Um, can you see my mouse on the screen? Does Adam want to show his face? <laughs> he texted me saying, "No." <laughs> he texted me saying his video might be a little choppy. Oh, okay. Coming in, just a heads up. <laughs> All right. So you, you could see the the large number of employees that Adam oversees within Public Works. Um, the majority of our maintenance staff. Um, also, uh, with me to my right here is Erica Quallen. She is our deputy director of capital projects. Uh, she's going to be presenting on the Pennies for Path and Open Space Fund portions of the presentation this evening. Uh, and then behind me, in no particular order, uh, we've got our Deputy Director of Water Resources, Dave Wheeler. Give him a wave, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our newest uh, member of the team, uh, Marisa Roraba, who's our Stormwater Superintendent. Uh, Jay Nadow, who is our Drinking Water Superintendent. And Bob Fisher, who is our Wastewater Superintendent. I think I got everybody. Great. <laughs> um, it's just one thing I wanted to point out. Um, so I sort of color coded these. Uh, we're doing pretty well right now as far as uh, having positions filled. There's only three open positions of the 39 current. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh -oh. All right. <laughs> um, so again, a very quick overview of the department. Uh, like I said, this is highway, uh, parks maintenance, and then stormwater, wastewater, and drinking water. So I wanted to give you an idea of the infrastructure that is within Public Works, and so we put some numbers up here. Um, you know, for our 39 employees and 20,000 residents, we've got over 2,000 water valves, 120 miles of drinking water pipe. We have 32 uh, wastewater pump stations, uh, which is the most of any municipality in the state. Uh, about 18 miles of force main, 75 miles of gravity pipe, almost 80 miles of stormwater pipe. Uh, we maintain about 86 miles of road, uh, about 50 miles of sidewalk, 21 miles of shared use path, uh, 12 and a half miles of on-road bike facilities, and uh, 367 or so acres of park and open space, depending what you count. <laughs> um, so quite a bit of space, quite a bit to do, quite a bit of infrastructure to maintain. Um, so I'm going to go through each division uh, and go through sort of the, the template that I think you're used to, uh, that you've seen from other divisions and departments so far, go over some successes, a uh, highlight of the budget proposals on the revenue expenditure side for each, talk a little bit about what's in the capital improvement plan uh, and what we're requesting this year, and then highlight some emerging issues and kind of spotlight uh, kind of a positive thing within that division. And then I'll pause at the end of each uh, section here for, for Q&A. So uh, first up, I've got uh, highway and parks. Where is that? Is that grandfather? It is. Good job, Tim. <laughs> um, so a couple of the successes in uh, fiscal year 22 and so far in 23. Uh, we did quite a bit of local road paving in 22. I'm not going to read that list. Uh, but it's at least a portion of all of those roads, or if not the whole thing, and line striping. 
Um, in fiscal year 23, we've done section, th we've paved section three of four on Dorset Street. That is from Garden Street to Aspen Drive. Uh, that was recently completed. And uh, wanted to also mention, uh, repaired a section of shared use path um, in Semansky Park near Stonehenge. Uh, so council included a new line item uh, for this fiscal year. It was $30,000 uh, for maintenance of paths. And uh, we repaired this and a section of Nolan Farm Road, there was a route uh, causing some issues with the shared use path. So Great. Uh, we, we spent that budget up real quick this year. Um, gets a, a request for more <laughs> there in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> So it's wonderful to be able to have the resources to do that. Like, stop, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we, in the first two months of the year, we were kind of used those up to correct those two issues. So got more identified for the future as well. Um, but let's see, back to the presentation. So on the highway and park side, I've got uh, FY22 actuals, the current year, fiscal year 23 budget, and what we're proposing for 24. Um, you're going to see a decrease there. Uh, that is primarily due to a grant. Previous years had grants, a uh, paving grant that we are not proposing to get in 24, although you never know, uh, but it is not currently in the proposed budget. Uh, moving on to expenditures, so I, I've broken out the highway and the parks maintenance as shown in the budget books that everybody has um, here. A couple things I want to call out, and again, you've heard this from other divisions. So a lot of employee benefits were shifted from the admin line items directly into the division budgets. Uh, so for the highway budget, that's another $660,000 roughly of why you see that, that number got so much larger there. Uh, that's just from shifting health insurance, pension, et cetera. Uh, we've included um, another $15,000 or requesting another $15,000 in our consul consulting services line item. Uh, this is primarily to help with public requests for traffic counts, vehicle speed measurements, uh, intersection analysis. We, we get quite a few requests from around the city uh, and we're looking for a way to better respond to those. So one of the things that Eric and I are working on is a way to prioritize those requests. But once prioritized, we also wanna make sure we have the dollars in the budget to actually do a little bit of engineering analysis to kind of figure out what's going on, where we're gonna move those forward. Um, another small note, we kind of reallocated some of our software. So uh, there's a chunk of our software fees that the highway division pays and the other divisions pay them back. So when you look through the budget, you'll see a big increase in that line item. It's just the way we've allocated software. Um, and then what I mentioned, so uh, we're requesting or proposing a $10,000 increase in that bike head maintenance line item. Uh, we'd like to do a little bit more with that. We've got a variety of things identified we'd like to move forward in, in coming years. So some items and that's for, separate from Penny for Paths. It is. So Penny for okay. Paths does not pay for General maintenance. Fund. Okay, yeah. good. That is new paths, nothing yeah. maintenance-wise. I think wise. we had asked you to start putting it in the budget, so thank you. Yep. Um, and then primarily in the, the parks uh, expenditures, it's just the, that shifting of the benefits from admin over to parks is just the big change in numbers you'll see there. Yeah, that's what... May I ask, may I ask a question on that slide? So I'm seeing the increase from the, at 23 to 24, about 1.2 million, and you're speaking to about half of that increase from the shift. Could you have a general idea of the other half of that 1.2 million? Yep. Pull out the big red binder in case we got specific line item questions. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Tom. I can come back to that next time, too. Um, so... I'm assuming you, you probably don't have this in front of you, but this is on the, the finance page of the website where you can go and you look at all the line items, huh? each one. Um, I, I meant to count up how many line items we have in public works. It's quite a few as we went through to build the budget. But um, I think you're going to see quite a bit in the, in the, well, if you look in the top part, so it's broken out now too, which is nice. There's the capital portions broken out operating and then staff portion. I think you're gonna see the majority of those increases up in the kind of the admin piece there, uh, salaries and things of that nature. Uh, and let's see, as I go through the different line items, uh, I have a slight increase in winter salt uh, and in fuel, because fuel prices have gone up. So you'll see a couple line items related to fuel, another $17,000 there. Although hopefully they, they have gone down and they'll stay down, so maybe 
you'll have budgeted enough. <laughs> yes, ho hoping. You're the right number. Yeah, I mentioned the 10 grand bike peb, and then I've got the um, tree care line item here. That's just our standard line item the arborist uses. You'll see an increase in that one as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, a little bit about what is in the uh, Highway and Parks Capital Improvement Plan, or our CIP. Uh, so one of the things we're just getting started on, started on is an expansion of the public works facility. Uh, we need some additional storage for equipment, so it's under a roof. Uh, we're proposing to also add electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that as a, a next step to electrifying our fleet. Uh, we need the charging stations in place. Uh, we have a variety of vehicles that we think we may be able to go electric with, uh, kind of the small pickup trucks and just kind of the, the run around town vehicles, uh, like the vehicle I use, for example, a little Ford Escape. Uh, we could convert those over time to electric as long as we have a station to charge them at. Um, and as time goes on, we can also look at some of our bigger vehicles. Um, we've already been looking at kind of the smaller tools and equipment as well. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, and then our public works facility is within our, um, it's, a, it's a three acre site, but it's covered under our MS4 permit. Um, and so we're proposing to do some stormwater treatment practices on the site as required by that permit. It'll help us meet some of our targets for phosphorus reduction. Uh, we have some significant fleet purchases in there. Uh, so proposing to replace a sidewalk plow, a plow truck and a mower. Uh, we had two additional um, sidewalk plows in the budget, which we move to a future budget year to keep the overall cost down. But we do have two sidewalk plows that are sort of up in their schedule. We try to keep those in a seven to nine year rotation. Um, so they're in good working condition. Uh, we were comfortable bumping those another year or two at the moment. So we, we kind of push those back. Um, and paving in our capital improvement plan. Uh, so we're looking mm -hmm. at here is paving of local roads uh, in FY24 and then the final section of Dorset Street in FY25. Uh, so that final section of Dorset Street is gonna be quite expensive. We are thinking maybe around a million dollars. Um, so once we get an engineering cost estimate, we may hold back some dollars in FY24 paving to make sure we can cover that in 25. Um, ash tree replacement program. So at the moment, we, we were looking at originally like $150,000 request, but we've paired that back at the moment to 50,000. Uh, to replace our, we have nearly 600 ash trees still in the city right away. Uh, so we'd like to make a little more progress replacing those before the emerald ash borer uh, comes in uh, and kind of wreaks havoc and, and kills those trees. Um, and then our signal replacement. So back uh, on October 3rd, you may recall, we were here talking about replacing all the signals on Dorset Street. So additional funding for that project uh, is included here in FY24 uh, per that conversation. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I know that the Natural Resources uh, and Conservation Committee, that they have been actively seeking to find something instead of the, the tree replacement program, that um, they came forward uh, requesting some ARPA funds from, from the council for. Um, can you provide some, some uh, additional information regarding you know, that negotiation between our, our arborist and the NRCC as far as the, the tree replacement program versus the treatment, which is much less than $50,000. Sure. So I, um, I will note there's a fourth grant that wasn't on your consent agenda this evening related to this uh, that Mr. Wheeler's working on. Uh, so I don't know if it'll be next meeting, but uh, you'll see some information about that in an upcoming meeting uh, to see if we can bring in some grant dollars to help pay for this. Um, but it's been difficult for us to put together a solid plan. Uh, we need, because of the costs associated here with it, and knowing whether we're going to be working with a $50,000 or $150,000 budget really changes. Um, at $150,000, we can run through a replacement program in like six years. If that's 50, obviously that's considerably longer. Um, and so we've been trying to find ways to add treatment in. Uh, we're still hesitant to recommend a large scale treatment. Uh, we're thinking we're gonna pick some select areas uh, where the trees, the ash trees are in very good condition and perhaps uh, make a suggestion or proposal that that's where we focus those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have anything yet and I don't wanna say more than that. We need to circle back with the committee uh, and talk a little further with them uh, on this issue.
Great. And I have a second question. Yeah. And I've already emailed you about this. Um, yeah. And you, you, you've let me know that several, several neighborhoods are very fond of having kind of the, the radars for the speed in, you know, sensitive areas. And I'm thinking about White Street with Chamberlain School. I'm thinking about Proctor Avenue with Rice High School. And there might be other places that you would suggest as well, um, since you're a better place to know where those residents um, are, are, you know, re reaching out from. Um, and you had said $5,000 would be um, kind of the the cost of those, you know, small signs that would read the speed of the cars. Is that something that we could include in this budget? And I just wanted to put it out there for us to think about because I, you know, we, we all. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought I remembered reading it in one of the presentations. So we do have those included at this point in the CIP for White Street. Uh, I don't have other in the radars. The I think I added that in when uh, we did the CIP. Yeah. I put I a little extra in funding in there. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're, I think uh, yes. I'll go back and double check. And if they're not, I'll, I'll clarify that with you. But I believe I included them for White Street in the CIP okay. for that extra if it was five grand. Yes. Fast. I don't have other locations in mind at the moment. Uh, but that kind of gets back to that consulting line item where I really want to have a way to right. take all these requests, prioritize them. Right. make a decision about what needs to be done and then fund them through a capital program over time okay. um, in a very kind of linear and predictable process. Fabulous. And I know that there was some issues with the battery. Is, mm -hmm. is it going to be solar powered or is there going to be waste so you don't have to come out every week to, to change the battery? Well, that's part of the expense. The, the ones we have now are battery powered. Those batteries last um, three days. We'll see if Adam makes a face when I say that. We got to replace them, um, so it's constant going back out and replacing batteries, five days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when we have the if we install them with solar panels and the batteries, they obviously we don't have to maintain them. But it's just an added expense, and our current equipment doesn't have that. We can move them around. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but every five days, that's an added expense too. I would think. I Absolutely, but it, it's yeah. what we have at the moment yeah. from an equipment perspective, and it, it allows us to move them. Um, it'd be more difficult to move them around if they had solar panels attached. Oh, okay. So the one on White Street would be moved potentially? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be permanent? That's proposed as permanent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Carry on. Yes. Okay. Um, so resources requested. Um, I have kind of mentioned some of the line items already, uh, but I guess the, the big request uh, from the highway and parks maintenance perspective is the addition of a parks maintenance staff person. Um, we are working to summarize and sort of total up our additional areas of park acreage and sort of the time it takes us to maintain all the city's parks. And then uh, what we see on the horizon is new developments come online and that infrastructure, that park infrastructure is turned over to the city. So we'll have that summary for you in the future. Uh, but recently I did add up the city's road mileage mm -hmm. to talk about and, and just kind of demonstrate how um, we're, we're going to be looking for sort of labor side related requests this year and next. Uh, because of the additional road mileage is just one example and that comes along with sideway sidewalks and things of that nature um, we have not added an employee in the highway division since 2000 uh, that's as far back as I went and looked uh, we did add some stormwater staff when we created the stormwater utility in 2005 and 6 and we recently added a horticulture specialist uh, but otherwise sort of the numbers within the highway department remain static um, similarly in parks other than the, the horticultural specialist to remain static over many years. Well, this is the additional um, parks maintenance staff person. Would they be able to, or is that in a, a study, um, be able to sort of proactively estimate, um, let's say we find some open space that we want to buy and we buy it and it's 80 acres. Um, there's a cost to that in terms of uh, the maintenance of that. Would this person or someone in that department be able to say, as we discuss the purchase of something, that our estimate for maintaining that piece of property and mowing it or whatever it needs to be done to it um, would be X? So we kind of know going in. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So that's something we're moving towards. We started moving towards it this year. In fact, if you look in the CIP, there's a little box at the top. 
that talks about sort of maintenance and what we think it's going to cost. Uh, we started to fill that in for some things. We want to do a better job of that next year for future CIP projects. But that, those type of estimates would be done by myself or Erica or Adam or, you know, whichever our superintendents, I guess, the projects related to. Uh, we're trying to figure out the best metric for doing that. I know Erica had pulled some information nationally, uh, but we just haven't gone back through to pull that all together yet. But we are headed that direction. Will that include, you know, parks and open spaces that developments put in in their proposal and then along with the roads, you know, six years later or whatever it is, the city, they bequeath it to us with all the carrying costs, which is, you know, great. But then there's all this carrying costs that we haven't necessarily um, funded or thought about. So we, you'll be able to, that would be included in that conversation? That's a great point because we were talking on a CIP level, um, but if we are accepting private infrastructure as public infrastructure, mm -hmm. we need to determine the point at which we have that conversation. Uh, so we'll be able to make those estimates in the future uh, once we have a little more time to work through it. But yeah, when when do we have those conversations, I guess, is something well, we can get back to you on. Well, I think it would be helpful before we accept <laughs> the gift of a little dog park or a playground or something to know what our responsibility is and, and the cost and liability and that kind of stuff. Because it could add up if every new development has you know, a couple acres of stuff that they... Yes, yes. But, but that just is one of those pieces. That's how we get all those new roads that we maintain. You know, and I recall our conversations with um, Stone House. Is that, is that what it's called? Stone House off Hinesburg Road? And their roads were too steep and cobblestone, excuse me, too steep, too narrow. And we opted not to um, take them over. Mm -hmm. Although most developments, as I understand it, we do mm -hmm. after a period of time. So okay. if I can just jump in for a minute, I, I just want to remind the council that this is part of why we have Erica. Now this Erica was a Erica's position was a position we added in, you all added in in last year's budget, trying to connect that um, capital infrastructure, whether we are building it or the private sector is building it, we're taking it on to what the ongoing investments are going to be needed over time and really embed that in public works initially. Um, I think it is an open question how we, at what point in a permitting or land use planning process, we have those conversations with the private sector developers, uh, but certainly as Tom alluded, we're doing that actively now. You know, Tom spent a lot of time and Erica spent a lot of time with a lot of thinking about the bike ped bridge and what that's going to cost to maintain over time. So we're very clear with the community about what those needs are mm -hmm. going into um, that kind of capital investment. Right, but there's all these little things that really there can creep up things. and all of a sudden it's the tipping you know, point we've been talking about. For Pardon? The, the tipping, tipping point. point we've been talking exactly. about Exactly, yeah, yeah. And as time goes on, I hope to have more charts and graphs like this to show you how we've added over the years. Yeah, no, it's uh, We're just starting to pull that information together in this budget cycle, so stay tuned. Thank you. Um, let's see, a couple of merging issues. Uh, so I think I already mentioned it, uh, but paving needs. Kennedy Drive Section 4 is going to be very expensive. It's planned for fiscal year 25. Obviously, we're here to talk about 24, uh, but we may need to hold back some paving dollars in 24 to help fund that in 25. Uh, so, and then we're working on updating a citywide pavement condition assessment. Uh, Erica and others have, have worked on getting us the software in house and getting out and kind of reevaluating roads so we can see kind of how we're doing on a, a citywide basis and how our, how our roads and streets are doing from a, a pavement perspective. Um, I mentioned the parks employee request in FY24. Um, so uh, again, in the highway division, I also mentioned that uh, we're going to more than likely be coming back in 25 and looking to add somebody there because it has been a while and that'll help us really deal with the things like line striping and pothole filling and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, ash tree management plan, we also already talked about. Um, I don't want to belabor any of these since we've covered them, but those are some of our emerging issues. And uh, our spotlight issue, uh, so very happy with this slide. Uh, this due to investment cool. <laughs> in our equipment and staff training, um, things like that, we are really trying to drive down how much salt we use in the winter. 
uh, while obviously maintaining you know safe roads for everybody. Uh, but if we can buy equipment that allows us to scrape the roads better, for example, uh, it requires less salt for us to actually melt off what's left. So in the photo here, you see the orange plow, uh, but it's the plow behind the plow. It's that little black thing there. It's like these individual little fingers that stick down and get in all the pavement grooves. And they really help scrape the ice and snow off the road after the main plow. And that allows us uh, to reduce the application rate of salt. So on uh, the chart there, you can see what we've done by winter. And I've got kind of a three year rolling average as well because you know winters are highly variable. But um, since 2014, we've really been able to, to drive down uh, the cost of this per lane mile. So that's something we're pretty happy with. And we're going to continue those efforts. And as we replace equipment, we'll, we'll do more of this in the newer equipment. I um, thought that was really neat. I yeah. read that aloud to my husband <laughs> <laughs> when I was going through this. It's <laughs> <Sounds> terrible. <laughs> so uh, that was our highway division. I'll, just, I'll go back here for a second unless there's anything else in highway and parks maintenance. Otherwise, I'm going to move on uh, to our stormwater division. Oh, Bob? Just in going to the CIP for highway, I didn't see a project for uh, Spear Street widening. It was it, last year I had asked for it to be moved from 27 to 25, I think, well, 27, 28, 25. To 20. And, still, and I, I just didn't see it. I didn't know if I missed it. It could be there. So I do not know if I have a Spear Street widening project. Well, I have, we've got um, a path in there, but I don't know that I have anything for widening of Spear Street proposed for FY24. We've got quite a bit in there on the bike and ped side, I guess. I... It's been historically in the, and, and seemed to have keep getting moved out. Right. And it got moved out, and now it's gone. And uh, um, from Swift Street to the Shelburne Line, Maybe you should come up to the, well, a knowledgeable resident. <laughs> Can you, will Just you the turn the green little button? Well, it has to be bright green. Oh, bright like green. Christmas green. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Bob Britt, three Adams Court. And just um, that, that road is the number one commuting route, most traffic for bicycles, um, for commuters, for transportation. And uh, we are trying to build a parallel path that is non, that's off-road, that's, you know, through the Hubbard Park and through, you know, the new sport, Spear Meadows all the way through uh, South Point and uh, South Village. Um, so that's progressing well, but that road is used by so many people, so many connections to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It needs traffic calming because people go 45, 50 on a 35 mile an hour road. But it's, I, I just wanted to see if it was in the CIP anymore. And if it's not, sort of why not? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you Thanks. for raising that. Is now a good time to comment on that? Yeah, so it is no longer in the CIP. Uh, I think it's because we're talking more about the off-road facility for bikes, uh, but that is certainly something we can go back and discuss. Um, if that's still the committee's desire, if that's still a priority, we have quite a bit in there. Um, and we're kind of jumping between the highway and the bike and ped. Yeah, yeah. When, when so we I, get I to that, when we remember, Bob won't let us forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else on the highway parks maintenance side? Nope. All right, so I'm gonna uh, jump over to our stormwater utility. Uh, the stormwater is an enterprise fund, right? So not general fund. Um, so here we go. Um, again, following the presentation format uh, for key successes in fiscal year 22 and then so far this year, uh, we have finished up the Muddy Brook culvert replacement project. That is on our border with Williston, uh, Kimball Avenue. Uh, so we replaced the failed culvert that had caused a shutdown on the temporary bridge. 
uh, and that included an additional shared use path to connect over to Future Path in Williston. Uh, so great project. Uh, we're very happy with that. Uh, there's a photo of it on the bottom of the screen there. Uh, Spear Street Gravel Wetland. Uh, that is a large public-private partnership uh, stormwater project with the Burlington Country Club off of Spear Street. Uh, the photo on the right is sort of construction phase of that. So that's the gravel constructed wetland that's dug out. Now they're putting in the stone so the water will flow through all that stone and get treatment. Uh, and there'll be wetland plants and stuff put on top of that stone layer eventually. Uh, but that was a great partnership. Uh, we have paused construction on there for winter. We'll finish that up in the spring and summer. Uh, and it received about $375,000 in grants. Uh, we received over $800,000 in grants to do engineering work associated with the three acre rule or three acre permit. Uh, so that is some projects that are city. Um, and then again, a number of public private partnerships with condo associations and businesses where a permit was issued uh, to both entities. And just wanted to make a note that all of these things together are really a uh, big part of what we're doing for climate resiliency. So, you know, slowing the water down, treating it, dealing with flood issues, making these culverts uh, whenever we replace them bigger, uh, allowing for aquatic organism passage, things of that nature. Uh, so I know we've talked about it at council before. Council's talked about it quite a bit, but I think the stormwater division in their work does, does a lot to improve our climate resiliency. I skied the Spear Street gravel pit today. I almost went down the hill, but mm -hmm. I could see the gravel at the bottom. It was kind of like exposed, <laughs> and I didn't want to hit that on my cross country and then fall face first into it. So I'll wait till there's more snow. But you created a really good, you know, obstacle there to on the golf course with your skiing. So thank you. There will be plantings and fences and things of that nature. <laughs> um, so uh, stormwater budget again, same format. Uh, as highway, there's really no major differences. Uh, the reduction here in revenue is associated with just grant revenue between what was uh, anticipated in 23 and proposed in 24. Depending how construction falls a lot of the time, uh, where that income actually comes in may be in either fiscal year, but that, that's the major difference there. Uh, similarly with stormwater expenditures, uh, any change there is just due to capital project spending. So the projects go to construction, obviously, we're proposing, uh, we have some going on in 23, not as much in 24. Uh, so there was no, nothing that jumped out there that I felt I would note on the slides. Um, what is in the stormwater CIP? Uh, so again, as I mentioned, a lot of stormwater treatment practice design. Uh, we still have these flow restoration plans in our stormwater impaired watersheds, Lake Champlain phosphorus TMDL. So we have to reduce the amount of phosphorus leaving the city, entering the lake. A whole lot of engineering and design associated with those types of projects is ongoing. Um, in FY24, we've got three projects that we believe will be going out to bid for construction. Um, it's kind of re, uh, expanding and rebuilding uh, existing stormwater ponds, uh, two on Kennedy Drive and one off Route 7, the Bartlett Bay stormwater treatment system. That was actually the city's first capital project when we started the utility. Uh, we have a project whereby we're going to bring additional water to that area, kind of on the other side of Bartlett Bay Road. So that's exciting. We've been working through some right of way there. Uh, we're about wrapping that up. Uh, engineering and design associated with the culvert under Bartlett Bay Road. You can see in the photo there, it's perched, it's undersized. Um, this has been on our list for a little while, a uh, number of years really, to, to get the engineering work done. Uh, we've had some preliminary work done. I think you probably saw that in the grant yes. application I referred to earlier. But so that is on our FY24 to-do list is to really get into the engineering design of that. Uh, outfall repair, there are requirements in our MS4 permit to stabilize outfalls around the city. So we've got um, some money set aside for that. And of course, some fleet purchases in stormwater. Uh, replacing one of our vacuum trucks, that cost is going to be split with the wastewater division. Replacing a street sweeper uh, and a one-ton truck. Is that um, also uh, used with Shelburne? Do they rent it? Is it that piece of equipment, the vacuum truck? Thing? So, yes, um, we do still work with Shelburne and kind of we'll send our vacuum truck and employees out and then bill them for kind of okay. cleaning storm drains or street sweeping. So yes. Yep. How old is our vacuum truck now that we have? Oh boy, Adam, are you still there? That's the level of detail our operations manager may have to answer for you or I'd have to open our large fleet plan. Yeah, the, we have two actually, and the oldest one that's slated to be replaced is at 2011. So it's not even 
of two. Two, two and so it's from 2011. I'm sorry, it's been 11 years old. Oh, okay. So they need the one of them needs the function. Is that or yes. That's the old one, the 2011. It's the oldest one. Didn't we buy one a couple of years ago? We did, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see that as we evolve. Uh, I think our newest one is an 18, and the older one, as you can imagine, it lives in a wet environment, and the whole the machine constantly works both in um, wastewater and in stormwater, and it's a wet environment. So that typically they tend to rot from the inside out just because of the nature of what they do. So um, it's we endeavor to try to replace our stuff at eight years, and so we're, we're actually beyond that with this vehicle. Um, we may hopefully replace it next year but with supply issues it may not happen just because there's such a long lead time with these specialty vehicles so but we're trying to get it in the queue now this is the is this the kind of truck that has the the big white pipe that's down in front of it that you use to put down the street and the, but you also use that in wastewater issues as well yep okay so if i was splitting the cost of that expense piece we're putting between each fund does it do more work for for wastewater than it does for stormwater Oh, I would say it's equal. I mean, we've got, we used to clean pump stations, you know, oh. sewer lines oh, as okay. well. There's a hose that cleans out pipe on the front of it too. That big spool yeah. in yeah. front of the, the piece that goes down. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Um, let's see. So talking about resources requested now. So in stormwater, uh, a very modest request for a rate increase, 1.64%. Uh, the chart there. Uh, I know some people like to talk dollars and some like to talk percent. So if you like to talk dollars, it's the blue line and the left axis. If you like to think in percentages, it is the, I guess that's purple on my screen and uh, the right axis. Uh, but you can see stormwater has generally had uh, small rate increases over time. Uh, part of that is the grant funding we've been able to secure for stormwater projects, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but this 1.6% increase, uh, that would make the proposed rate for FY24 $7.44 per ERU or equivalent residential unit. Um, and that would be an annual increase of $1.44 for a typical homeowner. Um, emerging issues on the stormwater side. Uh, so we had three streams that were recently um, classified as chloride impaired. Uh, Engels B, Potash, and Centennial Brooks. So now they're on a list to receive a TMDL. Uh, so that's something we're keeping our eye on, certainly. Um, and then uh, compliance with the three acre permit. I mentioned it earlier. Some of those deadlines are fast approaching. Uh, I think one of them is coming up in January. Um, and so that impacts not only uh, us on the municipal side, but also a lot of private property, uh, certainly around South Burlington and around the state of Vermont as well. And where is the chloride coming from? Uh, generally speaking, it's understood to be uh, salt application, yes. application from winter de-icing. Um, and that's, of course, not just roads. A lot of private property does similar. So, mm. And uh, again, I alluded to this a minute ago, but uh, one of the reasons we're able to request such small rate increases on the stormwater side is just the success that the stormwater division has had uh, obtaining grant funding. So just under $13 million in grant funding since... Uh, 2005 that uh, the division has been awarded. Uh, so really happy with that. And hopefully these grants you approved us to apply for tonight will just keep adding to the total. Let me stop there. Any, do any quest stormwater questions? Do you know, do they use salt at the airport or do they have something else? I don't know what they use at the airport. Glycol for de-icing. Okay. Um, but, you know, their parking lots, I would assume they use salt as well, just like everybody else does here. Yeah. Is there any um, kind of educational initiative occurring around that? So there is some. Uh, we've certainly talked to various private property owners about it. Um, a solution to that has to include private property. So when I say a solution, sort of reductions. Um, and it's going to take a number of years, too. Uh, but you'll see as you walk around, if you look this winter, kind of the after a storm, those parking lots in the city that are kind of white from salt application, that's kind of an over-application of salt. Um, and so there is an important education component there that, yeah. And that may be something that we're required to do in a future MS4 permit. Um, and thing we've talked about and done a little bit of already. Thank you. Can I just ask, um, has there been, maybe I should suggest a, a discussion or a consideration at some point 
for all of these special um, enterprise collections of money that um, we also think, I know in some of the charts we're the lowest of Chittenden County or the state or something. We charge very little, which is great. But we don't seem to have a, um, a funding mechanism for replacement of things that um, I thought we had. I mean, I, I was under the impression that our enterprise funds really were there to pay for so we didn't really have to bond when we needed to build a new facility. But that's not the case. And I'm just wondering if we should consider, you know, as a, a community, um, a, a way to start saving some of that money so the bonding can be less. So I'd be curious your thoughts on that, Tom. I think the council has started doing that this year with the capital reserve policy, uh -huh. which enables us to roll CIP dollars year to year and not just return them to fund balance. The enterprise funds do have their own own fund balances that are, in theory, exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. our ability to um, invest in capital without big spikes in rates when we need right. those investments made. I think the challenge is, especially for things like wastewater, um, those dollar figures are just so significant that the, the dollars we would have to be accumulating pre taking on debt service um, to you know raise $34 million, for example, to do this mm -hmm, upgrade mm -hmm. are, are significant. But I think the step that the council took to do the CIP reserve policy will help us offset some of that and smooth out that uh -huh. either uh, tax rate need or or utility rate need over time. Okay. Tom, do you have a different No, I guess I would agree, and that would be a great conversation to have. Uh, to date, we haven't done that in a major way. Uh, you know, the, the fund balance in wastewater right now is about $2 million, and uh, Jesse mentioned the cost of some of these capital improvements. So I would say if we were going to do that previously, we would have had to be talking rate increases pre um, before now. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And we haven't been, but we can I, certainly but, um, change going forward. And now that we've sort of revamped a little bit our CIP process, I think uh -huh. uh, we can do that in a much better way, too. Yeah. I mean, I think over time, you just have to collect a little bit. Mm -hmm. It helps. I mean, because, you know, we build a new plant and we don't need another one for 25 or 30 years. So mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to be at the bottom of the rate. Right. for the state um, in my mind. I mean, it, it's great, but I also think the investment is, especially as we grow, mm -hmm. I mean, we want all this industry and homes and things, and so mm -hmm. some of our needs expand faster than other communities, yeah. it seems. Mm -hmm. I, I just was looking up the propylene glycol, and couldn't we have our economic development committee reach out to our community businesses and encourage them to switch from salt, including home-based businesses, to this propylene glycol? It's, I just, yeah, I think it could be a nice way for them to, it's in within their charge. And, sure, I wouldn't yeah. be yeah. opposed to having so them get. I'll just mention the airport has a collection system uh, for the propylene glycol that just doesn't get discharged to streams. It goes through and uh, I think it's an infiltration gallery, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not the kind of thing that you would just want to spray and let sort of wash off. Oh. I think you'd be trading sort of one pollutant for another. Um, and I'm sure there's a cost component that's as well. That's for de-icing. But that's for de-icing. Well, what, yeah. what do they use on the runways? I, that's probably some kind of chloride. Yeah, probably they some do kind of salt. salt. Oh, okay. I will, I will oh. find out. I can call Nick and find out. I don't know. We've never really talked about what is applied to the runways. I don't know. It says it's for good for streets. It's pet safe. I don't know. It's not just for de-icing what I've seen here. What, what's the, where, do the run, where do the runways drain to? Do they drain back towards Potash Brook or on the other side? Uh Large property, so Centennial Brook, some of it goes to the Winooski. I know some of the um, overflows go towards the Winooski River, towards our airport parkway plant. Okay. 
Uh, some of it goes towards Muddy Brook. <laughs> so depending where you're standing on that giant property. Yeah, big piece of property. But so th I think this is a good conversation to have, and we may be having it sooner than later anyway due to the impairments, the chloride impairments in our streams. Uh, so we can come back with more information on this type of thing. So I'm going to keep going then uh, into sure. the wastewater division. Uh, so starting off with our kind of key successes uh, recently. Uh, so in FY22, uh, three pump stations uh, got refurbished. Oak Creek Village uh, got some new pumps and larger diameter and pipe to improve flows out of there. Um, and then we also did work in Valley Ridge that's completely rebuilt. You can see that uh, with so much of our infrastructure, you know, you don't see what it is from the ground level because a lot of it's underground. So that's just the control panel <laughs> out front. And then um, a pump station on Spear Street rebuilt with new panel and controls. Um, back in April, uh, Bob and I were here talking about a need for repairs at our Headworks building in Airport Parkway. Mm -hmm. uh, so since then, those repairs have by and large been completed. Uh, we were talking this morning about some repairs just that are left in the grit chamber and some welding, uh, but that was successfully done. So we're pretty pleased with that. That'll improve throughout our processes, kind of be able to screen that material out right as it enters the plant. Uh, doesn't foul up processes and pumps and things later on. In the, in the treatment process. Right. Um, moving on to revenue. Uh, so pretty good increase in revenue uh, shown for FY24. Uh, a lot of that is a reserve transfer in for engineering work associated with the Bartlett Bay plant um, upgrade. Uh, but also we are anticipating some additional revenue uh, in wastewater due to development in the city. Uh, we've issued quite a few allocations um, due to again, just through the nature of growth in South Burlington. And those allocations, of course, uh, folks pay for those as well. So that is what constitutes the increase there you see on the revenue side for wastewater. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, we've got, well, we recently got costs back. So we are part of a consortium around Chittenden County that buys chemicals uh, for wastewater plants. Some significant increases there. So the group bulk buying gets us kind of a, a better rate, uh, but even so, uh, we've seen some big increases in the caustic soda and lime line item, which is used to adjust pH through the treatment process. Uh, also alum, a significant increase in alum that is used at Airport Parkway. Uh, that is important. It really kind of binds up the phosphorus. It's injected into the waste stream, helps bind up the phosphorus and removes um, it in the treatment process so that it's not discharged to the lake. Um, and so I'm just going to put it note there on the spotlight slide how we've done for phosphorus removal in a few minutes but those are some of the big increases on the on the wastewater side the fiscal proposed for fiscal year 24. Uh, what is in the wastewater CIP? Uh, again the Bartlett Bay wastewater treatment facility upgrade uh, so that includes the plant upgrade uh, four pump stations nearby the plant and solids management and handling uh, we talked about that back in October we're going to talk about it again after this uh, for the, the bond uh, necessity hearing, so I don't want to spend too much time on it right now. Uh, we have a Twin Oaks pump station upgrade. Uh, then there's some debt payment um, line items in the CIP uh, for previous upgrade to Airport Parkway and the Hadley Road pump station. And then again, that uh, fleet purchase splitting that vacuum truck with the stormwater division. And then, uh, so due to all that, uh, this is sort of those chemical cost increases and planning ahead for costs of the plant upgrade, uh, we're proposing an 8.3% increase in, uh, in the wastewater rate for FY24. So again, the blue line, uh, if you'd like to talk in straight dollars, cost per 1,000 gallons, that is the left axis. If you prefer percentages, that is the yellow line and the right axis. Uh, and so I, I'm gonna focus on the yellow line for a moment. Um, you could see that large spike where it was it was over 25% increase. That was associated, right, with when we did the, the Airport Parkway plant upgrade. So there was a major increase there to help pay for that. Since then, uh, our increases have been quite low. Um, and so this is sort of our, our largest increase in a while at 8%. It's been below 5 is what the proposals and approvals have been. Uh, but this proposed increase would uh, make the rate $48.20 per 1,000 cubic feet and uh, roughly result in a $30 annual increase for a typical homeowner. Um, and um, Councillor Real mentioned this earlier, so I included this slide in here. Our rates, uh, this is FY22 data. This is uh, the last time we collected it. 
Um, our wastewater superintendent called around and got data and then converted it to a normalized format here. Uh, but you can see us all the way on the right. So currently we are uh, the lowest uh, for a single family homeowner. Our rates are, are lowest in the area in the state, as far as we know. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what folks in the other communities are doing this year, but I imagine they're also going to have uh, fairly significant increases as well in their proposals for FY24 budgets. Uh, and then our emerging issues. So chemical costs went up. We're hoping they don't continue to go up at the 50% rate we saw. Uh, we actually use uh, two different chemicals at each plant, alum at Airport Parkway, PAC at Bartlett Bay. The PAC did not go up. We're wondering if that's going to happen in the near future. Um, and there's not a lot we can do about that, those increases, uh, though we could discuss using less of those chemicals. They'll result in uh, more phosphorus discharge to the lake. So we can talk more about that in a second when I get through the rest of the slide here. Uh, always keeping an eye on biosolids regulation. Uh, so our airport parkway plant takes all the solids from Bartlett Bay and airport parkway. We produce a um, exceptional quality or EQ class A biosolid. Uh, but we have seen proposals in the legislature over recent years uh, that would kind of restrict what these materials can be used for. Uh, and that's due to concerns over PFAS and microplastics and the like. So that's something we're always keeping an eye on. Um, we talked about the bond vote for the wastewater plant. Uh, I wanted to mention again, we've got a rate study we're currently working on. So in the near future, uh, I'll be back here uh, with the consultant to talk about our rates and sort of some planning uh, related to what we were talking about going forward. Uh, and then um, pump station upgrades. We're always going to be doing pump station upgrades, I think. Uh, every year from Public Works and Wastewater, you'll be hearing us here talking about pump stations because we have 32 of them. Uh, with a design life of about 20, 25 years. There's at least one up every year. Congratulations to Bob Fisher and Will Se Shepard. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I snuck, even though those aren't emerging issues, I didn't want to have two spotlight slides. So I <laughs> snuck their awards on this slide so that I also had space to show you this. So the emerging issue is, is we're, you're getting more awards. That's right. It's a real issue. Bob's running out of wall space. It's an, em an um. emerging issue. We like those kinds of issues. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so to go back to that conversation, I was putting a pin in. So this um, chart shows the phosphorus coming into our two wastewater plants in blue in pounds. And then the orange uh, line is sort of the phosphorus that leaves the plant. So you can see the major reduction there. Mm -hmm. uh, by permit, we are allowed to discharge about 2,700 pounds a year. We're currently discharging 300-ish, 350, whatever the average there is. Um, and a lot of that is by using some of those chemicals I mentioned earlier, the alum and the pack. Um, so if we were concerned about costs, we could have a discussion about dialing back that line item and not using as much of that. That would in turn increase the amount of phosphorus we're sending to the lake. We would still put us within our permit thresholds. Uh, we've always operated on doing the absolute best job we can, removing as much phosphorus as we can to benefit Lake Champlain. Uh, but it is a conversation we could have if that was council's desire. What are we allowed to discharge? I missed the 20 pounds. Annually, 2,786. Wow. Yeah, uh, Tom. I fully support what we're doing, but I'm curious with the cost, how much do you think if we wanted to go to the maximum amount, would we possibly save the city? Not that I want to do that, but I'm just kind of curious what uh, you think we're spending in excess to uh, further clean up the lake. That's tricky. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not linear. You would need to put a significant amount of chemical in. If you didn't, you would have to move in and out the pre-treatment before uh, 2000. You were putting out 50, 60,000 pounds. Um, you could probably reduce cost by 10% maybe or so. Maybe down to 10% probably, I would say. 10% of what? Like, what are we talking in total? So, of, uh, of, so maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 oh, So the, It's not the, worth it. The alum line item proposed uh, for 24 is $280,000. And that's up significantly 100,000 from FY23, which is 180. And that is due to the, just the cost of the chemical. Um, and so again, it's, it's a conversation we could have. It's something we'd have to think about and come back to you on with the actual savings there. But just to keep I, I pace with what we're doing. I don't want to have that conversation, for one. <laughs> I just want to know how magnanimous we are. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it gives back to us. We drink it. <laughs> so. Are the pounds of phosphorus entering the, the plants, is that just proportional to the amount of, of wastewater that you receive? Generally speaking, yeah. Okay. And, you know, up years and down years. Um, 
So anything on wastewater before I move to drinking water? And then I think that's the last division you have to hear from me before I turn it over to Erica. Hopefully I haven't chewed up all your time, Erica. I would much prefer we spend time educating people not to put phosphorus on their lawns. That's what I, you know, that would be little money compared to yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, so moving on to drinking water. Um, so uh, just recent successes again. Uh, radio read units, we've continued our program to install these across the city. Uh, having these units reduces the time required to manually read the meters, kind of avoids mistakes from misreading and things of that nature. Uh, required maintenance, um, it's not the most exciting thing to talk about, but it's very important. We have some aging infrastructure, not only in uh, wastewater, but certainly in water as well. Uh, so they operated and kind of maintained over 1,500 mainline valves, flushed every fire hydrant in the city. Uh, I should have wrote down how many we have. I don't recall, but uh, it's quite a few. It takes quite a bit of time. Um, and then we've started uh, some engineering on some really uh, exciting capital projects. Uh, one is the addition of water storage in the high service area. Uh, another is an interconnection with the uh, Champlain Water District um, transmission main behind the U-Mall. It's sort of in the interstate right away back there. Uh, so we have a connection there, but we're going to improve that, um, and that'll help serve uh, city center and sort of help us be able to route different ways, ways water can get to city center in different ways if something were to happen. So kind of looping our system. And then uh, pipe extension in that same area to achieve the same goal. Um, getting into the revenue side. Uh, so our revenue increase here is assuming just a 1% increase in the volume of water sold. Uh, we're gonna talk about it again in the capital projects. We are required by regulation to do a lead service line survey. Uh, it's going to be an expensive project. We don't anticipate finding a lot of lead service lines in South Burlington, um, but it's, it's something we have to do. Um, and so that's in our CIP. Uh, but we do anticipate receiving a grant to help offset some of those costs. So you'll see that in the revenue. And then similar to wastewater, we have a transfer in from reserve uh, to help pay for some engineering work associated with those capital projects that I just mentioned we did some preliminary engineering on. How do you figure out um, whether a, a service line is lead without digging it up? So you review records, and if you don't have records, you may have to dig it up. Okay. Hence the cost. <laughs> yes. Whoa. Okay. And so we're, we're pursuing different ways and, you know, different exactly. consultants okay. and, and ways to manage that. At least for a younger too. city than some places. Are these <laughs> records all paper or are some of them a electronic digitalized uh, jay how much of this have we digitized our service line um we're still working on it um, i think we're going to our record our system is dated uh, 1930s okay the so oldest section rolston road 1940 shelburne road 1930s um we don't expect because we only had one superintendent from 1945 to 1978 wow. Um, wow. and he always said we didn't have any it was always copper unfortunately that doesn't help us with the state uh, with the federal right. requirements so we have to go out and prove them wrong okay thank you uh on the expenditure side um so we, when I built this budget and, and turned it into Mom, Martha, and Jesse, we were assuming a significant rate increase uh, from the Champlain Water District. So we purchase water from the Champlain Water District mm -hmm. and then distribute it and sell it to our South Burlington customers. Um, this budget was built assuming just over an 8% rate increase from them. Uh, actually, last week we got information it was actually proposed to be 9.5%. Um, so that's what's currently in the budget, though. And then uh, proposes an increase in associated with the capital projects I mentioned. So again, the capital projects on the water side, um, water storage capacity, that area highlit in blue on the right, that is the high service area. So it's the majority of the city uh, is served in the high service area. Uh, and that is uh, the tank on Dorset, or the water tower on Dorset Street tank. Uh, I mentioned interconnection. Uh, we are continuing with the water meter replacement program. You'll see a line item in the CIP for that. Lead service line survey we just talked about. And then some debt payment for previous investments in the city's water system. You'll also see those recurring debt payments, which are ending soon. 
Uh, and then, um, so I, I switched the colors on this chart on you. I don't know why I did it from the other two. I guess to make sure you're still still paying attention. Um, Wait, but right, yeah. the, uh, the gray line in this case, that is if you like to look at the dollars uh, and then the blue line in this chart is percent increase. Um, and so the scale on this one's different. It only goes up to 12%. Uh, different from the wastewater chart. Uh, but we are proposing an 8.5% rate increase here uh, to deal with some of our planned capital projects, uh, replacement of aging infrastructure, and, um, and the like. That, that'll result in a $36.21 per 1,000 cubic foot rate, and that would be about a $23 annual increase for a typical homeowner uh, at the 8.5% proposed increase. Um, Similar chart to what I showed you for wastewater, but this is uh, rates for drinking water. Again, South Burlington is the lowest uh, that we found when we called around for FY22 rates. Similarly, we expect others are gonna have significant rate increases, especially now that we know, you know folks that are served water through the, the Champlain Water District and that nine and a half percent increase, uh, that'll likely get passed through to customers in all municipalities that are served by that. Um, and then, I think I talked about it already. Lead, so emerging issues, it's just our aging infrastructure, the lead service line. Uh, and then we'll be back, or I'll be back, uh, and Jay will be with me and probably a consultant or two to talk about some of these capital projects. Uh, we are tentatively planning a bond vote uh, on those for town meeting day 2024. So that's sort of on the horizon here. But I hope to be back soon to talk to you more about the capital projects. What is uh, that hole in that pipe? It's a, that's a water pipe, right? Yeah, Jay, what caused that one? Do you recall? That is uh, external corrosion, hot soils. And you'll notice that there are actually two. There's one right oh, there yeah. in the center. Oh, on the right. One yeah. on the side of the pipe. On the other side of Was the there pipe. another pipe touching this pipe? Some other type of no. pipe? No? No. Wow. Just hot soil. So water was just leaking out of this thing? Yeah. So you said hot Gushing. soil. What did that? What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, some soil. Okay. Whatever it was. Oh. Huh. Okay. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, and just the spotlight item here for uh, the uh, the water division. Uh, so water division employees are using technology to improve their operations. They have these valve actu actuators uh, as part of their asset management program. So uh, kind of it, it turns the valve on its own, so it reduces the physical kind of employees constantly turning valves, reducing back and shoulder injuries, uh, makes it a little easier for them. Uh, and it turns the, the valves at a preset kind of torque to give an accurate count of rotation, which is something <laughs> they need to know if they have to go out there and turn a valve. They like to know how many times they have to turn it uh, when it's for to open or close it. Um, Does it memorize where it is, has a GPS in it, so it knows when you're there that it's going to be 30 turns? Unfortunately, no. But we do have that in our asset management program. We're building that out more and more. Next, next model. Uh, and so before I turn it over to Erica, I guess I'll pause there for any questions on uh, the water budget. Are you thinking about putting the new storage next to the current storage on Dorset Street? Yes. Because I, of the height? I don't want to get too much into it because I want to come back and talk in much more detail about this. Um, but that is the location we have in mind. But there is space there. And we do have uh, the physical ground space. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. The twin towers. All right. Uh, I'll give Tom a break uh, for a short while before he gives another presentation. Uh, but I'm going to start with Penny for Paths, um, looking at that special fund. Going through the same format, starting with some successes um, in FY22, uh, successful coordination with VTrans on Hinesburg Road to get three new crosswalks put in at um, Prouty Route, is that the other one? And the trail. Um, 30 RFBs were upgraded so that they are fully in compliance. Uh, a lot of them, it was the signs were only facing one direction. They're supposed to be back to back. Uh, so that is a real improvement for safety and visibility there. And the crosswalk on Kennedy Drive at West Twin Oaks Terrace was also completed in FY22. FY23, um, a big thing here is that we've kicked off the Transportation and Land Use Climate Action Implementation Plan. 
uh, which we will be talking a lot about in the next year. Um, but that is a very exciting thing. And uh, I think there will be a lot of coordination between uh, Penny for Paths future projects uh, with this component. Um, and the Bike Ped Committee is also very excited about this moving forward. They have a representative there. Uh, we are working actively towards a walk bike master plan, thinking about applying uh, to the CCRPC for their annual work program in FY24. But you'll hear from Havila and myself and the bike ped committee uh, that they, uh, the committee is fully in support of moving forward in this and it makes sense with timing of the comprehensive plan getting underway. And so uh, having that backing from the committee and potential funding to help with that is a, a big win. And um, does the re revenue uh, um, for Penny for Paths end in FY uh, twenty five? I can't remember. It was ten years, right? But I, I can't remember when we did it. Um, I believe it. Uh, I mean, was it? It's FY twenty eight. I have it on a future slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. About when it's we'll, get, we'll get to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yet the bike ped committee. They have been hosting some uh, public meetings. Tim came for uh, the start of one this past week uh, on a lot of projects that Penny for Paths supports. So just good collaboration happening there. And we are beginning a condition inventory of all of our shared use paths, much of the same that we do for our roads and that pavement, creating that same uh, data set for our shared use paths. I'm going to show the um, expenditures and revenues slightly differently than the previous ones because the way these balances carry forward, when I was looking at them to lay it out in the kind of template, I, I look at the funds and I couldn't wrap my head around it clearly in two separate tables. So I'm going to have it shown here so you can see how the uh, balance changes over time. Looking back, um, FY21 is just kind of where I'm showing so that we can see actual spending. $400,000 roughly in the balance there. A lot of expenditures in FY22, a lot of uh, big things happen there and a lot of projects under design in FY22 that are continuing. And um, 23, that is what has been spent so far um, and plus a little bit projected for our CIPs. And then 24 and 25 are both um, based on the CIP plans. There should be a negative in front of that 250 on FY25. Um, but then you can see in the note here that the FY24 revenue is based on the assumed grand list growth, um, talking with Martha about that. And then FY25 is just a 1% grand list growth from FY24. Uh, so that's how the projections are done there. You can see based on what we're uh, proposing to spend, we have plenty of money and the fund to continue that effort. And a lot of that is, um, there's a lot of money floating around for these types of projects. And the fact that we have Penny for Paths is a really good leverage point in those applications because we can provide the match. So, wrong computer. So going into the FY24 CIP projects here, first, um, I wanted to just let you know about one update from the last round of CIP that you saw. Um, there was one change, it's in a future year, so it's not impacting FY24. There was a change in the scope of the Queen City Park Road shared use path. I've been talking with the city of Burlington on their uh, component of it and their timeline, and it made sense for us to include our full section and not just a small section that had been shown. Um, so in FY27 and FY28, it used to total to $150,000. And now it's spread out between FY26 and FY28, starting a little bit sooner. And it is, what is that up to? 80K in FY26, 510 in FY27 and 355 in FY28. Um, but of that, it is showing that we are proposing. I should have done this math before. Uh, is this another slide that you're- No, this is something in? that um, will show up. Is Did that make it in the packet or is it just there in was, the new budget book? There was information in the packet, but 
Yeah, I think it is just the CIP that was uh, uploaded to the city's website has been updated to reflect the changes that Erica is talking about. So I just wanted to make sure I remember to get it out there. Um, so that has increased, but 80% um, of that is proposed to be grant funded in there. Um, so that is in a future year. Um, but so looking back at FY24, the projects being shown here are um, the final design and construction of the Dorset Street shared use path. We are moving through uh, the earlier phases of design and right away on that project. Um, similar for Spear Street shared use path, that is just kind of like one design phase behind Dorset Street. So we're moving through design and that um, will go through those next phases. The Mary Street sidewalk is now being shown in bike ped rather than city center. It's highway impact fee funded rather than uh, TIF funded. So it just made sense to put it here. Um, the Swift Street shared use path connection. Uh, we have the start of design going in here for um, the little bit of connection that will need to happen when Spear Meadows is constructed. Uh, but we imagine it might take a little bit of time because of wetlands, so we wanted to start on that. And um, three of the four crosswalks that we are currently in scoping studies for that are likely to be recommended to put one in at those locations, uh, putting in $15,000 for design of those three, and then construction is in the following year. The, this is the, Mar the Mary Street. Um sidewalk we would try to get that constructed before we reopened mary street is that has anybody talked about that yet that's not a topic here. for tonight i just wanted to say that we can i think that. that that would be the goal yeah um i think a lot is not down here yet either but i think we would also um, want to connect that up with the you know the connectivity of garden street right Wilson right Road garden that. street first sidewalk and then maybe talk about it okay Correct. Question on the slide? Yes. So I don't see Lime Kiln Road, and I don't have the CIP in front of me. Is that still on the far out radar for a couple of years out? And do you think the penny for paths is still going to have enough resources to address any of that very expensive uh, improvement? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the phase one, the one that has been designed, ended up coming up a lot more expensive, is currently listed as FY26 and FY27 spreading that out just to give us some more time to chase funding more than anything for that because it is a pretty hefty uh, price tag there. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, so this is just a snip here of the Dorset Street Path, um, which is a very exciting project, making that connection between Old Cross and Sadie Lane. So Penny for Paths. Uh, we don't need more money from you. We just need you to help continue growing the grand list is <laughs> really uh, what is needed here. Uh, but I just wanted to note, as Tom mentioned, Penny for Paths doesn't pay for maintenance be uh, according to its current pilot language. Uh, so that bike pad maintenance line going up to 40,000, uh, if we want to keep uh, installing these types of facilities and we have the money to do that through Penny for Paths, uh, there is there are costs that come with it that we need to be thinking about. So you're recommending $40,000 for next year's budget? That, that's the line item in the highway budget. So going from 30 to 40. Mm -hmm. So some emerging issues here. Oh, we actually have until FY 32. 32. Okay. Um, so just thinking about that as we look at. Like 10 years. That could be, that has to be wrong. I think we only gave it 10 years. That might be the projection of when we would run out. What? Oh, spend it all. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was when the number hit zero on our uh, okay. projections. Okay. So I think it does end in FY28 um, and with current list of spending okay. goes to FY32. Um, so just thinking about that as we look for funding and my job is to think uh, mainly in 10 year chunks. So thinking about that moving forward. Uh, material costs, as Tom talked about, rapidly rising. So um, the maintenance line item doesn't go quite as far, but also paths are just more expensive, um, especially if we want to 
build them well um, and have a good enough sub base so that we don't have to replace them as often. Mm -hmm. And the last thing here is just thinking about data. Uh, we have a lot of data on other sections of our infrastructure, but as shared use paths and sidewalks and crosswalks become a larger and larger portion of our infrastructure, it's important that we know where they are, know their condition, know how they connect or don't connect. So that's something that uh, I have been thinking a lot about. With the data that we do have, um, a quick analysis showed that 86.4% of residential buildings in the city are within a tenth of a mile of a shared use path. Um, disclaimer, that doesn't mean that it's a tenth of a mile from a connected, a fully connected section. Mm -hmm. That is going to be more than a 30 minute GIS exercise to get there. Um, and this isn't units, so it's actually quite, it's a higher than that. If we're talking in units, this is just a residential building. And uh, we already have over 20 miles of shared use path, but we have uh, 3.2 mi more miles that are currently under design or are planned for design within the next five years. Uh, those four shown uh, right there. Are there any other questions on Penny for Paths before I move to open space? Nope, let's carry on. So open space, uh, some of the goings on here, you will be able to see soon. Uh, the Wayfinding Project in Wheeler Park was completed uh, that was an effort with uh, recreation and parks as well as um, open space folks there. And an accessible path to the Wheeler Treehouse is also complete. So now there is a nice sure pack path so that um, all folks can get to that treehouse. In FY23, we have gotten back in full swing uh, for the path parking lot and viewing area at Hubbard, which is a, a larger effort than uh, just a path at a parking lot viewing area may initially seem. And the Red Rocks management plan was also updated, so that helps us get a clearer picture of what it takes to maintain something like Red Rocks moving forward. And that ties directly into the trail improvements that have been ongoing. Uh, they are still in permitting, taking a little while, um, but that permitting should be complete and ready for construction within the fiscal year. The fund, uh, the funding here in open space looks a little bit, um, there's a bit more going on here than Penny for Paths. And this is uh, just making sure we know, this is only the half cent that goes towards open space directly. This is not the half cent that uh, deals with land acquisition. Um, so the open space revenue is very similar to Penny for Path if you cut it in half um, because it's a half cent here. So those projections are done the exact same way. Um, the expenditures were also laid out similarly. FY 23 and 24 are a bit higher because there was quite a pandemic slowdown in a lot of this work. Um, and again, costs are going up. So when we made this next round of CIP, there was uh, some growth in costs due to inflation there. And the open space note repayment is ongoing at about $125,000 a year. Oh, wrong computer. Is that uh, repayment, which is that? Is that for Hubbard? That is from the $1.5 million that was initially taken out to start the open space fund. I didn't understand what you said. We took out a loan, right. for a $10 million loan for the for the renovation of the parks. So they're just paying back the loan. So that's, yeah. They're what, paying back the loan. Veterans Memorial? Which park? For the whole. It was oh, the for system. the whole open oh, okay. space uh, okay. yeah. project, yes. It was for, um, there was no dedicated uh, open space for that. It has been, the love has been shared from that. Looking at the CIP and FY24, how that 390,000 breaks out, a lot of it is going to Hubbard to finish the design and go into the construction for um, all of that new infrastructure there. 
uh, totaling to 240 and it is broken up like you can see hundred thousand dollars in grant revenue and the rest is split 50 50 between rec impact fees and penny for paths um, the penny for paths of course is because of the recreation path um, and the rec impact fees can be used for the other parts uh, red rocks um, that's the stuff that's in permitting right now for the parking area some trail improvements and a lot of erosion repairs uh, to finish that design and construction, um, and that is all from that open space debt. Um, and Wheeler, there are a few more items left in the management plan and the open space priority list uh, that was put together a couple of years ago. There's about $80,000 of work associated there projected. Um, and again, that's funded through the open space fund. <clears throat> I look forward to when Hubbard has a path that's parallel to Swift Street that is not swampy. <laughs> <laughs> after a couple of days of rain and people get creative and going around and around and deeper into the grass to try to avoid the water and the mud so if things go well we can get you it's there nice, by the end of fy24 it's a natural open space so i get that <laughs> yeah it is a recreation and natural area so finding a balance there resources requested same thing as penny for paths just Keep helping us grow the grand list uh, so that this fund can continue to grow. <laughs> um, and a note here, the um, note repayment will be done in FY27, paying off that debt that $125,000 a year stops in FY27. So the revenues will uh, increase quite greatly there. Emerging issues permitting is always a concern when dealing with natural areas here. The State Wetland Department um, is uh, a department that we work with very frequently in any of these natural areas. As you mentioned, Tim, they're very wet in a lot of these places. Um, so that coordination needs to be happening from the very beginning. And these sites are large and involved so they can end up in Act 250 at times. And these projects, uh, they're not necessarily as straightforward as certain things like looking exclusively at a road, exclusively at a shared use path. There's a lot of things going on. Um, so at times it leads to a very large team. There's a lot of technical coordination between all of those different components. So it's just something we think about when uh, soliciting consultants for projects and as we move through all of those different phases. And another little uh, data analysis here, 68% uh, of residential buildings are within a quarter mile of an open space area or a park uh, across the city. Um, and we are getting closer to a new project manager who will be starting in FY23 if all things go well, and they will help to take on open space projects um, so that there can be a bit more uh, of a dedicated effort from one person to be uh, more focused on those ones directly to really see them through completion and manage all of that technical coordination. Um, and like we mentioned, the permitting for trail and drainage work in Red Rocks, it's been going on for a while, but it is apparently moving forward from what's been reported back. Is your first data point, is that as the crow flies? Uh, so the way it's done is, I'm thinking about the like GIS steps. Yes. Okay. Yep. Again, I can, I could get you a number of by oh, the no, road uh, in a in a day's worth of GIS or at least half a day. <laughs> Great. Um, and so that's our last slide there. Questions? Well, thank you. That was a lot of information. <laughs> but you have 40% of the city budget, so do it in an hour is not bad. <laughs> or an hour and 15 minutes or whatever. All right. Thank you. So, I apologize to the next guy for taking his time. <laughs> and I will see you in a Are few you? agenda items. All right. Thank you both. All right. So item eight is um, considering the council to consider a necessity resolution and declaration of intent on the need to bond for improvements to the Bartlett Bay water treatment facility and consider placing the question on the town meeting day 2023 ballot. All right, uh, good evening again. 
Uh, for those just tuning in, uh, Tom DiPietro, Director of Public Works, uh, and presenting with me is Colin McNeil, uh, the city's attorney. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is um, basically a necessity hearing for the bond vote for improvements uh, to our wastewater infrastructure. Uh, so in order to have a bond vote uh, related to the treatment plant upgrade, uh, council must pass a resolution that indicates the following, uh, that there is public interest or necessity demands the improvements, uh, that the cost of the improvements will be too great to be paid out of the ordinary annual income and revenue, um, and order the submission of the, of the proposition to incur bonded debt to pay for the public improvement to the voters on town meeting day. Uh, that's a statutory requirement under uh, Vermont. And so what I'm going to do is do a quick as I possibly can overview of the project. Uh, you will remember that we were here on October 3rd uh, with the project engineer, Jenny Oster, who did a great job in a lot of detail on this project. I don't want to recreate that here, so I'm going to move quick. I'll catch you up on your, your schedule. Uh, but please, if there's something you really want to know, feel free to interrupt me. We just wanted to give uh, a flavor of this project to those that maybe didn't see that. So uh, here we go. Uh, Bartlett Bay facility uh, it was originally constructed in the 1970s. Uh, it was upgraded in 1999. Uh, here is a general overview. It's a 1.25 million gallon per day plant. That's the design capacity. Um, keeping in mind here, so the expected useful life of a wastewater treatment facility is 50 years with upgrades planned every 20 to 30 years. Um, the mechanical, electrical, and process equipment needs uh, replacement and refurbishment every 20 to 25 years. Uh, Bartlett Bay, that equipment is about 23 years old. So we're, we're right in that range. Uh, we've anticipated this for a while. Uh, and these upgrades give us an opportunity to incorporate advances in technology. So to improve our treatment, our efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, things of that nature. Um, what has been going on at the plant? So you can see, uh, here's just a couple examples of kind of the status of things down at Bartlett Bay. Um, kind of wear and tear on the equipment, the clarifier, uh, leaking ceiling in the pump station in picture two. Uh, the blowers were installed in 1987, uh, need of replacement. And then um, there's a storage tank there and you see a little weep hole above the ladder. Uh, so just things of age need replacement. Uh, some critical items that do need to be addressed though is grit removal. So uh, the screening is now obsolete and it's ineffective. It's allowing things to move into the plant which again can foul processes and pumps and things downstream. Uh, the UV disinfection system, uh, that's sort of the end of the process. That is no longer supported by the manufacturer. So if we were to have a failure there, uh, it would be very difficult and expensive to, to kind of replace that system. So that's like a critical need. And then that tank, uh, we can't even fill the tank all the way up at the moment because of those weep holes. So it's only filled to the lowest hole at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, existing site plan, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you can see the different buildings. Uh, this is current conditions. And then uh, as we go through uh, our preliminary engineering, kind of lays things out a little bit differently and make use of uh, existing space, kind of shifts things around this new operation maintenance building, uh, new sludge handling tanks, aeration blower, uh, new headworks building. And so uh, that is the first component of this. I guess I should have mentioned uh, the vote here is for uh, three different components. It's the plant upgrade and then it's solids handling. So in the treatment process, all the material that settles out, those are the solids. At Bartlett Bay, those materials get trucked up to the airport parkway plant um, where they are turned into a class A biosolid. So very brief history, airport parkway plant was constructed in 1967. Uh, it saw a major upgrade in 2011 and um, as part of that upgrade, we went to a two-pad or a two-phase anaerobic digestion process. Uh, if you look at this from a hydraulic standpoint, we don't necessarily need to upgrade, but there is a way that this is balanced and regulated. Uh, and you may remember from the third, we had a longer conversation about the volatile solids reduction and the ratio of those to the waste activated sludge or WAS. So basically those volatile solids, those are what comes out of the primary clarifier. Those are very active. The, the WAS is very inert. That's at the end of the process. So it's a, a proper blend of those goes into the digester. Um, and that's where we're running into issues. Uh, I know um, Mr. Fisher recently filed a report with the state to explain how we're gonna address this issue. And this is our, our plan is um, what I'll show you here. It's the addition of a 
additional clarifier uh, and um, some additional storage, uh, fixing some storage tanks at the airport parkway plant. Uh, this will also allow some additional operational flexibility for our operators. Uh, we'll be able to take a clarifier down for cleaning or an emergency. Uh, right now, we don't have that ability. Uh, this clarifier was always in the plan, but it was eliminated, uh, value engineered out during the last upgrade. And so we've come to a point where we need to, to add it back in. Uh, I think I said all this already, so I'm going to skip through here. And uh, the last piece of this uh, for the bond is refurbishment of four wastewater pump stations that are within the sewer shed of the Bartlett Bay plant. Uh, so the city has 32 pump stations, uh, 23 of those go to Airport Parkway and nine to Bartlett Bay. Again, most in the state, <laughs> most pump stations, and we're adding more uh, with new development we're seeing. We're expecting to gain a few over the next couple of years even. Um, so the four that we're talking about here, though, uh, that are part of the proposed bond vote are three pump stations down in Queen City Park and one on Bartlett Bay Road and Associated Force Main. So uh, map uh, is coming up on the screen is difficult to see, but this is off of Central Avenue. Uh, the red dots show the existing pump station locations. So there's one pump station here that collects wastewater kind of off Lions Ave, another Queen Station. Queen City pump station number two, this part of Central, that all goes to pump station number one, which then pumps all of that wastewater out of the Queen City Park neighborhood up towards Fayette Road, where it eventually makes its way to the plant. Okay. Um, and then the Bartlett Bay pump station, this is up near the plant, uh, takes wastewater from the area of Bartlett Bay Road, uh, Bingham Road, Twin Brook, and it brings that to the plant. Uh, why do we need to do these? Uh, these pump stations have been in service for over 50 years uh, with upgrades, little upgrades here and there. Typical lifespan of pump stations, 25 years. Um, we've seen some, uh, well, obviously all the costs of repairing everything have increased over time. Um, and all four pump stations are located very close to Lake Champlain. So some of our older pump stations, um, it's just certainly a concern as these things age. We certainly don't want to have a, uh, issue at the pump station that causes wastewater to spill out and, and leak into Shelburne Bay, um, which is, as you know, where our, our drinking water comes from, where the Champlain Water District uh, has their intake pipe. Um, I think I've said everything here already. Just iterate. So we're also starting to see some failures. So we've had a, a force main crack or break on uh, Queen City Park number two. Uh, nothing reached surface waters, thankfully. Um, and then Queen City 1, we had a failure. Again, I, I think it reached nearby areas. Um, and then also, all, in addition to obviously not wanting this water to reach, or the wastewater to reach Lake Champlain, that would be a permit violation. Uh, so for all those reasons, we, we are proposing to improve these four pump stations. Getting quickly into costs here. Uh, so costs always come with caveats, especially these days. Um, so the Buy American... Uh, Build American, Buy America requirements are included here. Um, we're using our most recent bid information. Our consultant pulled this all information together. Uh, it's Hoyle Tanner and Associates in this case. And then they've included a contingency. They've escalated those costs, assuming uh, we would bid this in fiscal year 24. So they've escalated them for inflation uh, as best we can predict that. And then any engineering costs you see are just a, a formula based on the anticipated cost of improvements. So what that brings the entire cost of this project to is about 22.1 million for the plant upgrade, uh, solids handling about 1.8 million, refurbishment of the pump stations about 4.4 million, and then engineering associated with all that uh, by the formula around 5 million, and then 132,000 more for legal admin permitting to bring us to the total of uh, 33.8 million is what we're looking at for these. Um, so we recently talked about our rate increases in wastewater. They've been quite low since fiscal year 13. They've been about 2.2%, uh, not necessarily even kept up with inflation before inflation really took off here recently. Um, we're currently working on a rate study. So I'll be back here uh, late winter, early spring, hopefully, to talk about the results of that rate study where we're looking really closely at our wastewater and drinking water rates and kind of where we go from here. But just looking at this project alone, it's about a six and three quarter percent rate increase uh, for the four years running uh, to help to, to fund this project. Um, 
and then that would in, that would result in about a seventy-one dollar annual increase to a, your average homeowner versus that kind of steady two point two percent rate increase. Now, none of that factors in any grants we may get in the interim period here, which we're actively working on. Uh, and again, I'll, th I'll throw this up again, uh, just a comparison of rates in the region. Fiscal year 22 is the last time we collected this data. South Burlington, all the way on the right there, we have some of the lowest, we have the lowest rates in the region and possibly the state. Project schedule. Uh, so we are at that first dot uh, and preparing bond documents. Uh, we're gonna do some public informational meetings coming up, uh, proposing the bond vote. Um, if the legal paperwork we're going to go over with you this evening is approved, that'll be on town meeting day in 2023. That'll allow us to move into final design, uh, bidding in 24, and starting construction um, in a kind of two-year period there from 24 to 26. And a year later will be our first payment on the bond in 2027. Um, so why are we doing this now? Uh, well, we've anticipated the need and we've planned for this upgrade for quite a while. Uh, we're seeing what's expected, sort of your normal uh, deterioration over time um, and operational issues associated with those pump stations and the plant as well. Uh, and then bond authorization of this type uh, really indicates community support and makes the city more competitive as we go and we keep an eye out for grants to help pay for this and reduce that overall cost. Uh, an important note, a bond authorization for 33.8 uh, million does not mean we have to spend that amount. Uh, we're not obligated to, we can, we can spend less again if we're able to secure grants and things of that nature. Tom. So this is very helpful and uh, I definitely support this and I'm ready to make the motion, but on the why now slide, can you also with a straight face, Tom, say that this also will help increase the quality of the water near Red Rocks Park, thus increasing the likelihood that people will uh, be able to feel comfortable swimming in that space during the summer months? So I think issues and red rocks are more related uh, to stormwater runoff. Okay. Um, not not the necessarily. Of these pump stations. What's that? Not the proximity of these pump stations. No, the pump stations aren't leaking or anything of that nature. You know, wastewater is not reaching the lake or surface waters. Uh, this is preemptive to prevent that from happening because, again, these are quite old, almost 50 years old, these pump stations. And just... Thank you. Okay. Megan. Yeah. I think we talked about this before, but I received an email between that conversation and tonight asking if the federal government has any ARPA funds that they would dedicate to wastewater treatment plants. Yep. Um, so keeping a very close eye out uh, for any funding opportunities. So we've looked at ARPA funds. We're on all of the state lists. Uh, we are currently evaluating, um, there was a recent announcement that $40 million was made available available uh, for projects that support, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of that one, Jesse, um, community development. There was another $40 million that became available in ARPA funding, which we're going to try to pursue here. We've been talking with some of our consultants about um, that. Uh, the money was set aside for disadvantaged communities, and, um, and so they've got 30 days before uh, other communities. So it opens up to a community like South Burlington on December 29th. So we're hoping to be kind of in the queue and get an application ready there. Thank you. Just Is that adding, state 40 million for the state or for the country? Statewide. Okay. So just add another sentence about that. And we talked with our incoming delegation about this this morning. Um, the way the state has currently allocated those ARPA funds very appropriately are to target disadvantaged communities to build new. Um, and when the timeline gets close and so we need to get the, and the state needs to get those, those money up, those dollars out the door, then it'll, we are hopeful it will go to existing, um, existing communities or non-disadvantaged communities. So that's the lists that Tom's referring to. He, that, those are, we're getting in line for those things if those mm -hmm. spigots open. That's right. And we'll be more shovel ready than some right. other communities potentially. That's mm -hmm. our advantage, I guess, planning ahead. That's right. And so, again, I'll, I'll mention to folks maybe listening online or in the audience, uh, there's a thorough discussion of this project from uh, October 3rd. So if you're interested, please tune in. I actually hyperlinked it on the first slide to make it easy for anybody that wanted to go and hear an in-depth discussion of the projects. Um, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to you at this point, Colin, to talk I just about have a, what's in the packet. Can I ask a follow-up question? Is, is there a local match for that federal grant? The one, I, yes, there is, um, and I don't have all the details with me today. Uh, it's just something that we're we're following up on because every opportunity now we're 
okay. sending emails out to make sure we're chasing Follow down. Follow up at a future date after December 29th. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Colin? Yes, thank you. So we're uh, recommending that you make two motions tonight. Uh, the first, all, all, both of those motions pertain to documents that are in your packet. Um, the first motion would be to adopt a resolution of necessity for capital improvement project. Uh, this resolution incorporates the requirements that are laid out in 24 VSA 1755 that essentially says that the public interest or necessity demands the improvements that Tom has been talking about, that the cost of the same will be too great to be paid out of the ordinary and annual income and revenue, um, and orders the submission of the proposition of incurring bonded debt to pay for the public improvements to the qualified voters of such a municipal corporation at a meeting, meeting to be held for that purpose. So what you'll see in the resolution of necessity for capital improvement project is uh, lays out those three requirements. Um, and it also incorporates the, the draft ballot language that you have in your packet as well. Um, that, that language is included in the necessity resolution. So with, with approving the necessity resolution, you'll be approving that ballot language. Um, the second motion uh, is to adopt a declaration of official intent um, to reimburse certain expenditures from proceeds of indebtedness. This essentially is for the purpose of complying with Treasury regulations. Um, okay. Well, I would entertain a motion to do both those things. I, I, oh, do we I'm need two different separate. motions, so it's up there on the screen. I would make the first motion, and then if that's passed, okay. I would make the second motion. Um, first motion. I move to adopt the resolution of necessity for capital improvement project. And a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So the motion carries. Second motion, I move to adopt the declaration of official intent of City of South Burlington to reimburse certain expenditures from proceeds of indebtedness. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I do want to just call out that I, I should have done this in the beginning. This is Tom's first official budget presentation to you all as public works director. You've heard from him for 16 years in other capacities, 14 years, mm -hmm. 12 years. I don't know, long time. 16. Six, oh, that was me. I didn't always come to these <laughs> meetings, so. <laughs> uh, but first is the official, officially as the public works director. So Tom, thrilled to have you in this role. Thank you. We have no we award have for that. Award. <laughs> Only Bob gets the awards. Yeah, That's right. Jeez. Maybe next time. Next time. You can put a little plaque in under the... <laughs> and thank, thank you all for listening. To okay, thank you. It was, it was a very um, good presentation, I thought. I agree. Yeah. So thank you. Um, so moving on then to um, item nine... Um, receiving the community development presentation, including the energy fund. Alana Blanchard. And first, let's congratulate you on a wonderful illuminate. It was illuminating to a lot of people. And it, it took a lot of people to get it off the ground and um, make it work and I'm really grateful to all of you that volunteered and all of you that attended and especially to the uh, Recreation and Parks Department that put it on so it yeah no, really it fun um, group effort so I thank you the first of many Let's see. sorry my um, I can't oh I guess I'll look up here on my screen, everything's covered. <laughs> so let's see if I can get down to the. <clears throat> Whenever you send the desktop setup, press the Windows key and E, you can switch it to rep duplicating monitor. Okay, that may be what's happening because it's not. Windows key and I wouldn't even be able to find those. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just not being responsive. It sometimes happens, so hang on. Here we go. It's just 
piece. Oh, she's been trying. <laughs> there, <laughs> it's just a little slow. So here we go. All right. Um, so it's uh, okay. So. Um, Alana Blanchard, Community Development Director, uh, really pleased to be here tonight to present um, the community development uh, budget uh, and um, in a few parts of the uh, CIP. Um, we, uh, let's, oh, my keyboard is just not responding at all. All right, there we go. Um, there. <laughs> it was a little bit delayed, also a Tom. Yeah, okay, Aaron, good. All right. Yeah. Um, I will adjust. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so I uh, am responsible for many aspects of the TIF district um, and the projects that are related to the to TIF district and that use tax increment financing in order to get them. Um, uh, built. Um, I also staff uh, two committees, Public Art Selection Committee and the Energy Committee, um, and am progressing very slowly uh, towards the Economic Development Committee. Um, I uh, And that may happen in the next fiscal year um, or, or during the fis this fiscal year. Um, and I also take on other projects. Um, my, my, t my sort of description for my position is very broad, so I can take on other projects as a sign. Um, and I try to uh, stay in touch with different organizations within the city, um, especially where they relate to economic development um, and um, business districts and downtowns. Uh, so in 20, uh, FY22 and FY23, I think you've seen a lot of this before, um, but there was a lot of recognition for 180 Market Street for the building that we're in today. Uh, and one of the fun things that happened is a lot of professional building related organizations really wanted to come and bring their chapter here and take a tour um, of the building. And so uh, the project architect and the different engineers all participated in those and showed off the building and the, especially the green features uh, as well as the spaces. I think, you know, for many people, it was just a fun building to see and learn about. So um, civil engineers, the architects association, and then the heating and cooling engineers came by. Um, we also received a merit award um, in last year. Uh, so, uh, and then you also um, are aware, a huge highlight uh, for the year was um, securing 9.7 million in raise grant funds, um, as well as the grant that really was able to spark Illuminate Vermont and get it going um, and uh, enabling us to have a downtown festival. Uh, and then um, Bepsi approved a substantial change to the TIF district, and um, the East-West Crossing project was launched, um, and City Center Park Phase 2 was a project that we kind of had on the back burner until we acquired the land for the connection between City Center Park and Garden Street Market Street, and so we were able to get that one going as well. Uh, so we, um, for community development, there are um, many different revenue sources, especially because we're talking about fairly large projects. Um, in terms of general fund, so uh, funds coming from property taxes or sales taxes or other revenue sources in the general fund, we are only, we're, there's no change. So we're still at um, 800,000. Um, we had been at 860,000 in the past um, and it was considered this year, it didn't seem the right year to bring it back up. So we're sort of level at 800,000. Um, fund 280 is the fund that we use to track all of the city center TIF district um, projects and all of the expenses related to those projects. So we have a variety of revenues that we will be using. This is not necessarily what's coming in, it's just about what is being spent in the next fiscal year, anticipated to be spent on these projects. So we estimate just that we'll spend about 1.2 million on grants, 3.9 million in debt proceeds, and um, 631,000 in TIF increment and zero in impact fees. Um, so the TIF increment um, is actually uh, what we expect to, to receive. It's not what we expect to spend. Um, so it's a little different from the other two. Uh, and then 
this revenue um, summary doesn't reflect grants. So grants that we have not secured are not reflected in the FY24. Sure, really. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, so I want to preface this by saying I'm not advocating for this to happen, uh, but I would love to hear your reaction to, I recall it was five years ago, uh, where we lowered the 800000 I want to say, to like seven or 720 or something, because we were looking at a pretty tight budgetary year. And from everything I'm hearing so far, we're looking at one of the highest increases or proposed increases that I've seen while on council. If uh, we need to start finding areas, um, knowing that you've recently presented on some optimistic outlooks uh, for the TIF Center, if this were to drop to as low as 600000 again, not saying I want to do this. Um, what is your reaction to this number possibly going down for this budgetary year? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think that there's, there's two responses. I mean, two thoughts that I have. Um, the first is that you are looking at some fairly large increases to the TIF district um, debt service uh, that are going to cover cover the time period when the TIF proceeds are not at the same level as the payments. Um, and so I would recommend being prepared for those payments. Um, and then the other, um, the other comment is that uh, even if the funds aren't there this year, those debt service payments will all still always be there. So, so you'll still need to provide the funds at some point. Um, and it, Will, would make it harder to get up to the 860 in future years. So, so, but it's certainly something, you know, we can always look at it. So. Can I add one other reaction? I agree with everything Alana said. Um, if that was something the council wanted to consider, another option would be um, we, are, we are running, as you've seen in the financials to date, we are running pretty well in FY23. So an option if you were going to reduce it going into FY24 would be essentially to use surplus to offset that tax capacity in FY24. It changes how we have talked with the community about how we support the TIF district and support those other, um, those investments that the community has made, but you could direct us to look at the FY, a potential FY23 surplus to do a one-time investment into the TIF district. Okay. Um, so, okay. Uh, so in the general fund, um, uh, as stated, in, in terms of expenditures, no changes. Um, there's 800,000 for the tip district. Uh, sorry, for the city center reserve, that's not actually in fund 280, but it is um, set aside for the tip district. Uh, 5,000 for public art, and that's citywide, so outside of city center. Um, and then the image that you see on the screen, that's a piece that's being considered right now by the public art committee to come before you um, this winter or spring uh, to make a recommendation. Uh, and then um, the recreation center, and this is a change from last year, but not in terms of the general fund. It has um, zero funds proposed to be expended um, in FY24. Um, and that uh, is, I think we had, we had anticipated um, ramping up design this year, and that did not happen. So at the moment, we have zero funds for the Recreation Center. The CIP Reserve Fund um, has 960000 in debt service. Um, and so that is moved, moves into the uh, Fund 280 and then is spent from 280 to service the debt. So it's in listed in both lo locations, but it's the same money just moving around. Um, we'll also anticipate spending about $5 million on TIF district projects uh, and just over $1 million on TIF district debt service. And what is happening is that we pushed off our major payments for a long time, five years for each issuance, and then at the end of that five-year period, we begin to make um, principal payments. And so we're starting to enter the time during which we will be making principal payments on the first debt that was taken out in 2017. Where is the art installation? Well, that's Do, a big question. Is it for? <laughs> we're actually asking Recreation and Parks and Public Works in January to um, give us some ideas. Oh, okay. Is it glass? Uh, it's acrylic. Acrylic? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And we all received the memo from the Public Art Committee asking for $10,000 as opposed to $5,000. Is that something yes. that... Yes, so, so what the Public Art Committee has done in the for this year is that they had accrued 5,000 and then so they're they're using the 5,000 and this year's 5,000 to make a 10,000 purchase, $10,000 purchase. Also, oh, it's not an additional $5,000 that they're asking us to add into the general fund. They they are they are making a request that the rather than 5,000 that number up there for FY24 would be 10,000. Oh, dear. okay. But five of it comes from FY23. I'm sorry. No, that was right? very confusing on my part. Um, so in the in this year, if they make a recommendation to you in FY23, Wait, it sorry. would be for 22 and 23. 22 and 23, 23 so. money. Yeah. Okay. So that was not not clear. So. Um, That's cool. Looks like a butterfly. It's faces. They look like faces. I'm sorry. Oh, Was it faces? Yeah. I I think they're somewhat abstract. Yeah. Okay. I thought it looked like a butterfly. Yeah, maybe. Or a flower. Okay. All right. Um. So this is a summary of our debt management. So we we are receiving about six hundred six hundred thousand of of TIF increment um, expected to from. Our TIF district, uh, the debt service would be one million. Our transfer to reserve is eight hundred thousand, recommended, and the city share of debt service, meaning for this building, um, is nine hundred and sixty thousand this year. Oh, it worked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, got a little too fast. Um, so our capital improvement. Um, FY24 plan, I think you've heard a lot about these. Uh, Garden Street, Wellston Road, Streetscape, the walk bike bridge over I-89 and City Center Park. Um, we're, we're working on moving them towards construction, um, so probably looking at the spring um, of FY24 for some of these. Um, possibly the City Center Park, we can accelerate that um, because that has no right-of-way acquisition in that project. Uh, and then, obviously, the walk bike bridge, we're really at the design stage, so that project um, would be completed more in FY27. So looking more at the 25-26 range to complete construction for the other projects. Um, and then we also, there are several um, projects that we've talked about a little bit, um, public art, recreation, uh, it, that are in the administration budget. So the last um, CIP project that we haven't talked about um, is the landfill solar array. That project uh, is uh, um, over a megawatt of um, solar uh, electrical production from a solar array. We are currently receiving net metering credits from that project. It's owned by Altus Power America. Um, they gave us a very attractive net metering purchase agreement. And um, at, after seven years, they will have received all of their federal credits from the project, and they would be willing to sell it to us, and that's part of our contract with them. Okay. So we will be, we recommend um, doing a feasibility study in FY24, so working with the Energy Committee um, and others just to understand the finances of, um, of the array, owning it, the, you know, the, um, net present value <laughs> of the array if we purchase it and so forth. Um, but that could have a big impact um, in two ways. One, it could in the short shorter term reduce um, what is available to the energy revolving fund from, from, the, um, from the solar array, but in the long term it could have a net gain in terms of value. So that's what we'll be looking at. Obviously the interest Rates are a little different now than they were when we first um, entered into the contract. So a lot of things to look at. And currently, half of the um, solar um, credits go to the school. If we, if the city bought it, would that be the same? Um, or is that something under the feasibility study? I think that would out? be part of that. But that's a great question. What one? Big open question. So, um, there we go. Uh, so, which brings us to the energy re 
uh, energy fund, uh, which is a revolving loan fund or, or a revolving, um, sort of, it functions like a revolving loan fund. It's administered by the city for city internal projects and Louvrezy is right there. Um, but uh, put this together, he actually manages the fund. Um, and so we just wanted to give you a snapshot of FY24 for this fund. Most of the revenues do come from the landfill solar array. Um, there are some funds that are coming from projects that it financed. So the stewardship fund, uh, which I believe was lights, um, the uh, hybrid car lease, police station lights, um, and this building, the solar on this building. Um, and then there are multiple projects that it will be fun funding in FY24 um, throughout uh, various departments, public works, police. Um, so both on the uh, renewable energy side as well as the um, conservation and weatherization side. I'm sorry, not renewable energy, but um, efficiency as well as conservation. Uh, and then of course we have bond issues in FY24 um, that are proposed. Uh, so the, um, the remaining four projects for the TIF district as well as um, the Garden Street phase one bond, um, all of these are TIF district financed and are not uh, will, would not raise the property tax, would not result in an increase in property taxes. Um, and they sort of further the interests of the city in terms of building a compact, um, a compact, walkable, pedestrian, bicycle friendly downtown. Uh, Tom. I have to invoke my inner West Dom just to confirm, though, yes. that it will not result in a property tax increase assuming the development occurs as anticipated. Because yes. it's. And what's anticipated is not a full build out of every single available acre, correct? That's correct. I mean, I think that's good to point out. Actually, I'm going to go back <laughs> and just, I'm just going to name the four projects. Um, and then when we do our next item, I will not. So Garden Street, uh, which is mainly the intersections of Williston Road, Midas Drive, since I have a nice picture of it up there, um, Midas Drive, the realignment of Midas, White, and Williston Road, some tightening of Hinesburg Road and, um, and Williston Road, the area in between that, which is all of which is Garden Street phase two, a streetscape on Williston Road between um, Dorset Street and uh, Hinesburg Road on the south side, the boardwalk connection between City Center Park and Garden and Market Streets, um, as well as the east-west crossing over I-89 are the four projects that um, the $15 million ballot question for TIF district financing would um, finance. Um, so emerging issues, um, you know, I think equity has a, been a big conversation this year, uh, and then we're still um, struggling with implementation, um, and I am on, on my projects, um, but I expect um, that to be a big focus for FY24 as well as continuing in FY23, um, the solar array, which we just talked about, um, and then um, seeking out funding opportunities um, for the district projects. And then, so FY24 going forward, um, uh, and especially looking past FY24, TIF district development, um, business districts in downtown, which might be city center, but it may be looking at other business districts like on um, Shelburne Road. Uh, and then um, uh, looking at our plans that um, have been developed uh, that sort of uh, support community development, such as economic development and cultural planning. So, um, and, you know, that's, I think both of those are things that you, you are considering for next year. And then in terms of a spotlight, I wanted to highlight the gallery. Um, we've been really lucky. One of the committee members uh, has, uh, has, 
stepped down from the committee and stepped into the curator role um, really, really um, smoothly. It's an honorarium position, meaning that it's sort of like being a coach. You get a bit of money, but not really, it doesn't really cover your hours and um, has brought in some really great shows and has some um, great ones lined up. Um, and we ended up uh, in, the, in the fall issue of Best of Burlington, so which was kind of fun. Um, but that was, that's been a really, um, uh, a really, um, f just a, a great way to talk to people downstairs in the, in the hallway and, and just, um, interact with the public. So that's been nice. It seems to draw a lot of people in. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think people come particularly to see the new, um, installation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that concludes my um, presentation I'll stop sharing and um, so now we can move to 10 the tax increment financing district adopting a necessity resolution and declaration of intent and the need to bond for all these different things and I met some people at illuminate who I I told they were, they came over from um, I don't know Ibby Street or something and they walked around, and I said, well, you know, you want to support, support the bond because that will build a, um, a walkway across right to downtown. And they were thrilled. <laughs> they didn't commit to voting for it, but they were. <laughs> they thought that sounded pretty good. So, Ivy. Ivy. Did I say Ibby? That's Ivy. Okay. So this is a very similar series of votes we need that you just took for Bartlett Bay. I have the language in front of me. Okay, go uh, for it. Oh, do you want to say anything about it? Um, we're so compliant. We I actually, I do ahead not. Of time and no. we're like, go. <laughs> I, I don't want to say anything about it, but I did want to point out that article um, XX. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, which uh, I would request that you consider voting on one that was provided to you today and not the one that's in the packet. And the change I have up, um, I actually don't have the change up. This is the new one. Essentially, where there's a B and it says Garden Street, it used to say Phase 2. This version does not say Phase 2. So it needs to say Phase 2. No, I don't want it to oh, say. Oh, you don't want it. Yes. To. Oh, this is what we want. Okay. This is the one that I would request. Good enough. Okay. I so this, this would be the same on. motions you passed for the Bartlett Bay. Um, just to recap briefly, the resolution of necessity for city center TIF district capital improvement projects that addresses the requirements of the stat of Vermont statute. The deck that also incorporates the ballot language which you have on your screen uh, above you uh, and likely in front of you. Um, and the declaration is is really just to comply with Treasury regulations. So we would request two motions, one to adopt the resolution and two to adopt the, the, regula the declaration. Okay. I move to adopt the resolution of necessity for city center TIF district capital improvement projects. Second. You good with that? Do I need to amend it with anything from the email today? Um, with the, were you reading the, rec the, the one at the bottom? I'm reading the recommendation in your memo. Um, okay. Okay, so that includes phase two out of there. Okay, um, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, signify by saying, by saying aye. 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 So that motion passes. I move to adopt the declaration of official intent of this of city of South Burlington to reimburse certain expenditures from proceeds of indebtedness. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So that resolution passes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank nice you. work. Good enough. Okay. Thank you, Council, very much. You just took two really big votes to put things on the ballot for our town meeting day. So thank you for that. So it's 33 plus 15. Plus 15. Is... Yeah. 48. <laughs> just, just under just 50. <laughs> Full of work to bring that down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you want, let, let's, why don't we take a quick five minute break? I'll move on to item 11, receive an update from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee and consider approving an, an update to the committee's charge. So Erica, you're gonna share this with us. 
Yes, um, I'm going to give you a brief intro for those uh, just joining online or if anyone has shown up here. I'm Eric McQuallan, Deputy Director of Capital Projects with Public Works. I, uh, for this agenda I, an item, I am here as the staff liaison for the Bike Ped Committee, joined by a couple of our members here. The person who will be speaking for most of this is Havila Gagne, our- right. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't see you, I wasn't looking. Our uh, Fearless Bike Ped Committee Chair. Um, and she's going to be bringing forth a few things um, the, that were laid out in a memo to all of you that you have in your packet regarding the committee charge change, which is an update um, to the charge that was last updated in 2015 when the name changed. Uh, do their yearly safety and policy updates from work that they have been doing and things that they would like to continue doing. Um, a very quick update on the completed Queen City Park Road scoping study. And um, again, talking about their support for the bicycle and pedestrian master planning effort. And there will be uh, one recommended action, like you mentioned, uh, which would be to approve the amended uh, charge, which you also have in your packet. So I will turn it over to Havila, who is online. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. You are on mute, Havila. Um, I think I spent half my day on mute. Thank you for having me and uh, my words of gratitude. Thank you for coming to all these meetings and being on city council. Like nine o'clock meetings are not really my thing, but here I am and here you are. So thank you. Um, I think the two main things that I really want to spend more time on um, are the safety updates and on the um, bike and pedestrian master plan. Um, so I might, I'll do the, I'll get the quick stuff maybe done early first. Um, the committee charge change, that's really mostly a name change. Um, uh, we're not really into the parks, we're really into the path. I think that's what that's about. Um, next is the safety updates. The, there's a sub group that worked on all of the safety recommendations and those are in your packets. I believe there are a total of 14 items. Um, I think there are no bad items on that list. <laughs> and uh, I think we tried to put them a little bit in order of importance, but it's hard to pick. Um, I'm not entirely sure how I can be of best service to the committee for going through things. I think my number one thing is paint um, and budget for painting. Um, my understanding is that Burlington repaints all of their crosswalks and fog lanes and bike lanes and lights or um, lanes every year. And we don't do that as often. And I think that would do a lot to help clue in drivers and pedestrians where they're supposed to be and how to share. And that's one of the things that we hear back from the community a lot is just road rage and um, inconsiderate use of shared spaces. Um, speed limits, it would be great to drop those down, um, adding more signs. Um, I also want to highlight the rectangular rapid flashing beacons. So there's a little lights you push when you want to use the crosswalk. Those have been updated um, 27 out of the 35 that we have in the city. And that's been really wonderful. And the committee would also, we also want to share that we've been very happy with um, DPW and they've gotten a lot done in the last construction season. I didn't want to forget that. I'm not trying to sure where else to, like I can go through and read all of them, but that was a list we wanted to submit to you and let you know what we're, what we're working on and what we're thinking about. Were there any questions on that part? I think it's a great list. Um, so we don't need to go through them. I read them all and um, I'm a walker. So a lot of these resonated with me. Any other comments? Although I would comment, I did use the flashing light to cross um, Dorset Street the other day. Cars don't, weren't very thoughtful about even recognizing. We were standing in the middle of the road waving so that they knew the lights were on. And by the time we got into the second two lanes, the lights had gone off. 
So these cars were coming at us, and there was no blinking light. <laughs> Dillard Farm? No, this was on Dorset Street. No, no, this was Dorset Street um, down near um, past the high school. Oh, at, at in front of the, the old city hall? Uh, the one farther down. There's further another down. one down there. I don't, I, can't, I don't know what road it is. It's San Remo Drive, I think. There's a, It was a new one. I said, oh, let's use this. Push the button. It started blinking. <laughs> and I'm watching these cars. So we kind of step out and wave. And the first car didn't see us. Another car ignored it. And then finally, we did get some people's attention. So they stopped. But by then we were in the middle section and ready to go across and the cars weren't stopping. We realized that the blinking lights hadn't been on long enough for two old ladies to get across four lanes. Largely because you had to slow people down to let them know that the lights were on and we were crossing the road. Yeah, I've seen that before with pedestrians. I almost feel like we need a pedestrian refuge or more clearly marked one. It may be even one of the RRPAs in the, in the median in between just to give people a halfway point. I know. I mean, it was just scary because I thought, oh, these work well. Woo. No. And the, and the roads were slippery. You know, it was snowy. So on top of that, they were. <laughs> Here's a shameless plug for that uh, additional funding for the consulting services um, around things like that. If there is a problem area yes. that goes through the prioritization, it can really be made sure that the right solution for the area is done so that you don't run into situations like that mm -hmm. um, because yeah. some things work really well in some areas and sure. less yeah. well in others. Yeah, no, and I like the way they're designed and they should work. I, I you know, I just think a lot of drivers are um, not as thoughtful and I, I don't know what will happen on Williston Road. I mean, that's not four lanes, but it's three at least full lanes to get across. Well, it is four between Hinesburg Road and Dorset. Right. Yeah, and um, even up to Staples Plaza. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the current project does have uh, pedestrian refuge islands on those Wilson Road crosswalks locations that are in design. Well, that would be good. But yeah. Yep. So I do have a question. This is rec these are recommendations, but they're not in the fiscal year twenty four budget. They are, or are they? That's these are some of the more um, some are more generalized around recommendations to move towards a more robust striping program, um, and some of them are a bit more specific that need to end up like going through a bit of a study process uh, at certain locations some of them can be done through like the regional planning commission the way they provide technical assistance over the years so some of these can kind of be picked away at in the study and determine uh, is it the right solution for that area um, so and some of these are uh, just things to consider as we move into new construction in certain areas to say this is um, an area that the committee has flagged as a good location for a crosswalk while we're here paving or repairing the sidewalk. Um, is there a way to bring these in? Um, so these are more of their yearly lists that get brought forward as part of their charge mm -hmm. um, and things that are incorporated as they can be and as funding allows, but also... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also serves as recommendations for us, like uh, improving or increasing the shared use path maintenance. The bike path maintenance line item comes from the recommendations from the committee to say uh, that there are problem areas that don't get addressed in a timely fashion. Do we need to take any action on this list of recommendations or it's just for your information, City Council? Yep, this is the what part of their charge is to report yearly on their uh, recommendations in this area. And part of their charge also, I meet with a member of the committee roughly quarterly to go over things like this also. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I like the speed limit review because uh, we still have, well, we... Dorset Street is 35 from, I think it's uh, Swift all the way to Nolan, but there's a sign that says 40 going southbound. 
So we, we need to get that corrected. It's, you know, in the spring, I think, when the ground is, is uh, not frozen. So because um, we remember we were reviewing the ordinances recently and that was pointed out and, you know, people, they see a 40 and they go, that's 45, 50. And oh, right. Yeah. And the <laughs> state, if it's a state highway, it's, you know, if you're 10 miles over the posted speed limit, they sure don't want to reduce it. <laughs> yes. This might be a segue to, I saw Bob Britt's hand was up, but I'd love to hear either have, have a lay uh, or uh, Bob talk about the Spear Street widening project that he brought up earlier and also overlaying that with the plans for a paved path that would be off of the road uh, that would also connect from Swift down to uh, the stretch of Shelburne. Do you have any comments on, on that topic that came up earlier? I can only speak briefly to it because I mean, my tenure here has been short so far. So I was not necessarily clued in on the conversations of how that project arose. I know that it was part of the Spear Street Corridor study. And that was one that fell under the highway CIP because it was primarily roadway related, even though it was to improve facilities for bicycles and pedestrians, it was very much a highway effort. Um, I am I can't give you a reason as to why it's not included in this one. I don't know about conversations around that one. Um, obviously, the shoulder is really great for cyclists that are going to stay on the road. And if there are no paths or sidewalks, it makes pedestrians feel a lot safer. It gives them some place to be. So with a uh, potential shared use path moving forward as we continue to uh, bite off segments of uh, Spear Street and Dorset and Hinesbury, as we move down those corridors, um, there will always be the fearless cyclist that will stay on the road regardless of shoulder size, but the need for pedestrians might um, be alleviated and would be met by a shared use path. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure necessarily about the long-term conversations that happen there. So I think um, I think I'm now the most senior person here who remembers that com that comment from Bob Britt without Andrew and Ashley and and uh, Justin here. Um, I we spent a lot of time this year with the CIP trying to smooth it out and make it logical and and rational of a ten year plan that we could actually accomplish, which meant things came on and off of it. And I think in that smoothing, it likely was smoothed out. So if that's something that the council wants us to put back in. Um, it's not one that immediately occurred to me as one that had been smoothed out. Uh, we certainly can look at that and bring that back to you in, in January with the budget if that's something you're looking for us to do. One possibility is the next sure. paving schedule for Spear Street, right? Would be a logical time to have the engineering or the design work ready to go so they could do the widening and add more asphalt if that is all it takes, right? So, but I don't know when that would happen because I can't, I thought they just did it like five years ago from Swift all the way to uh, Pheasant Way. Nobody remembers. Okay. One thing I do remember it being done. Yeah. So I think the question for council is, do you want us to go back to the CIP and add it in? I just want to note one thing and what was included in the FY23 CIP, I just pulled it up and what uh, the section that's being discussed a bit more here is that this um, FY23 CIP has it going all the way from Williston Road to the Shelburne town line. So it covers that whole stretch and it totaled to almost $3.3 .3 million. So um, I think that is probably where the smoothing came from because it was 2.6 of that in one year. Um, yeah, so it was not correctly changed. Um, in the CIP. Bob, why don't you go up to the mic because you do have the um, most history with this. Yeah, I mean, is the is the mic on? And then just for the audience. Thanks, Bob Britt, um, member, vice chair of the um, bike and pet committee. Um, what? happened last year is we moved it forward but it was also discussed that it was supposed to be just from Swift because of the paving that happened on Spear from Williston to Swift Williston Road to Swift that section was fine they, and we are building a path along that section from the Forest Service building down to Swift Street so that was basically under control 
the problem was from the from Swift Street to the to the uh, Shelburne line that does not have adequate shoulders and we were all we were looking for is that section to be widened so that when you walked from South Point to South Village with two feet of shoulder mm -hmm. on one side and a culvert on your other side, you could get there safely with cars mm -hmm. exceeding the 35 mile yes. an hour speed limit, um, you know, to get to common routes or to get to the new proposed soccer field that's going to be down there. So it's not for vehicles. We need to have traffic calming put into that design when that road is is widened um, so that we keep cars going slower, slowing them down. But we need that for people to get to neighborhoods. Okay. We, in, in South Burlington, we have a bit of a problem when Shelburne Road is 40 miles an hour. Then um, you got Dorset and Hinesburg, which are now you know, 45 in Hinesburg and 40 on Dorset. We need as a community to take back our neighborhoods. It's no longer that we have pass through roads. It's not Hinesburg to Burlington. It's going through neighborhoods. And it's time for us to start looking at each of our streets and saying, we're going to retake them. Yeah. Well, we and did try with Hinesburg. But that's um, but that's a state highway, and it's still 50 miles an hour right in front of my house, and then it goes 45 down past um, right. Butler Farms. And and it's funny because we just recently had a scoping of a crosswalk at Du Bois and Butler Farm. Oh my God, I know. And and uh, the results of the comments that we got back from the consultant is it won't meet the warrants because. It's too fast of a road, but right. it won't meet be trans warrants because it's too fast a road. But they won't let us slow the traffic down. Right, <laughs> it's right. It's, it's absurd, and it's again because transportation used to be just the vehicle. Now it's complete streets. But that's and, probably a state or agency of transportation issue on how they determine, um, you know, speeds on state highways. That, that used to be highways with nobody living along them except a couple farms, and now they are residential with bikers and, and children and stuff. So, you know, you might want to look at that because it is antiquated. I was talking to someone in transportation, and she threw up her hands and said, I know, it's just crazy. And Megan, in the answer to your earlier question about what, what would we like you to do with the list, mm -hmm. it, it would be really helpful if you blessed some of the changes somehow. I don't know what, when I say blessed, I mean <laughs> uh, basically say we agree with these changes. Um, some of the projects are in motion. They already have Penny for Path money to put in the remaining eight uh, RFBs to redo them, to, to upgrade them. We already have the funds set aside to put a solid barrier um, on Dorset Street so people don't use the rec path when they're going up Grandview or, or turning right on Kennedy, um, which, which uh, trucks, uh, pickup trucks tend to like to do when they're trying to get to do their right turn on, you know, um, and get past the, the traffic. Um, on uh, on Dorset Street, so we have those funds were already approved, and but they just haven't been built yet. So so they don't need to be. Though there are monies available for them that mm -hmm. have already been approved in in prior um, CIPs, but they just need to be built. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them, you know, we will need funds, and some will be funded by Penny for Path. And um, and some are just you know paint that's in the um, that's in the uh, BPW budget. Well, I I very much like the list. So yeah, could you um, maybe illustrate the list with um, 
you know, some notation. Could the committee do this, that this is in the works? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of look through this. I mean, it, it is two pages or two and a half pages. Um, <coughs> so we can focus on, oh, this isn't done yet. It's, it's a, sounds like a logical, um, or at least it's, it's something that committee feels is important. Um, and, and, and hasn't been attended to or hasn't been funded or whatever. That would be helpful as a, a statement from the committee for me to look at it and say, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. These are done or in the works and these are the high priorities and need to be done. And then we can talk about if there's funds for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wanna make sure we just like close the loop on the Spear Street widening before we get totally back into the other things. If it is the wish of council, we can redo the cost estimate from Swift to the Shelburne town line if that is uh, the wish of council because we obviously have the longer stretch that that was estimated out last year. But if you want the Swift to Shelburne line, we can look at what that would cost and see how to spread it out over future years so that it doesn't cause that big shift. Yeah, I think that would be great to have it stretched out over, you know, get the price and then we can figure out how to pay for it and when, because right. I, I think that's a, that's a really important road for cars and people. Okay. Yeah. And I'll work with and commuters. Uh, I'll work with Martha to make sure we're not putting huge impacts on future years and can do that strategically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. When we bring that back to council, let's not just put it in the CIP, let's call it out as a, as a thing for them to consider in advance of January 17th. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. Okay. All right. How are we? Did you have some other comments? Um, I think, yes. I think the last thing. Oh, let's see. I'm reading, I'm skimming to the bottom. Um, the bike and pedestrian master plan. That was a request that came up through the climate action committee. Um, as one of their key requests that we can support the, the function of that committee in helping people get out of their cars and choose other modes of transportation. So um, I think we're gonna be going forward with that. And then um, looking at skimming at the bottom of the memo, I think the last thing we really needed was just to share um, Queen City Park. We recommended a share use path. Um, there's a whole project, it's in the scoping study. They give you a couple of different options about what the um, construction looks like for that. And we felt like the shared use path was the best for the low stress users um, and is pretty consistent with the standards that we would look at in South Burlington. Um, the, which the request was for us to make a, rep uh, a choice and to pass it on to city council. So that's what we're doing here. And then I think, I think we just need, I can, do we just need um, approval from city council for updated charge? Well, you got to vote at home. <laughs> A big support. <laughs> okay, so I'm not clear about the Queen City Park issue quite at the moment, but we certainly can. Um, I am clear on you renaming the committee in your mission and goals. So if the council wants to agree to that. I'll move to approve and update the committee's charge. Is that the? And duties. And duties. That's Second. the document, correct? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Are you ready? Oh. We call them charges for all other committees, so I would charge. It's the mission and they've labeled it mission and duties, but it will be the committee's charge. Updated charge. The committee's charge. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So we've updated your charge. And then um, I guess I'm not certain. I think we gave you some good feedback on your list of 14, but I wasn't quite certain where the stuff on Queen City Park is. I mean, there was a whole report 
And what is it you want the council, to, what do you think the council needs to do with the report? You're, you're, there you go. Yeah, so I don't know that there's anything I actually need to do. I think, um, sorry about the dog, he's just a toddler from Texas. Um, I think you didn't really need to do anything about it. It was just, I think, to be aware of it and that we had seen it. That was what that was a request from um, whomever presented it to us. I think it was the scoping study. Most of it's in Burlington, not as to do with us. It is only Burlington, so they're going to go for the money. So, do they need us to say, or maybe just the bike and pet to say, this is, looks like a good design? I'm turning to Tim because he was on well, the committee. I there, there were like three proposals. I don't know if they actually picked one yet. Oh, you know, so. So I've been in a lot of conversations lately with Burlington DPW around this project and figuring out where it falls on our CIP to fill in our sections there. And they recently secured a VTRANS grant for their section to finish design and construction of the shared use path. So they're moving forward with that as the preferred design. Uh, so since they are moving forward with it, it does help us when we go to seek funding for our section of path on that, which is in our CIP currently. And um, at that point, we will likely need council support of this as the design that you'd like to move forward with. But at this point, there doesn't have to be any formal um, approval of that as the preferred concept. And like I said, it doesn't include the bridge. The bridge is still the big question mark at this right. point. Right, the narrow one-way bridge. That is mm, really no walking or well, I mean you can, but if you use a cane, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So the only part in South Burlington is where Detilio Sunoco is, right? I'm looking at this. The right of way the right of way through this whole corridor really varies. The um, oh. city lines move back and forth along the road, oh, along Queen city and it Park depends Park. who has current claim to the right of way because the road is often split. The parcel line falls in the middle, but the right of way varies across oh, okay. whose uh, is what. Um, so we definitely have the 400 feet between Central Ave and the bridge. And there are sections later on connecting to Shelburne Road that um, are also South Burlington. Okay. And, and the signal is complete. That was done last, like, spring. Okay. Thank you. Well, good. Thank you very much. I just have one. Sure. Um, I just want to recognize Erica. She has been incredible. She's been here six months? It'll be six months on January 5th. Six months. She has gotten more done in six months than we had gotten done in the last three years. So oh, I, we are blown away on the committee with this We're going to run out of money, higher, though. Because so. <laughs> you get so much done. <laughs> Also incredibly uh, good at writing grants. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> as long as you we fund did allow your... in the vote that we could bond so we can move as many projects forward as possible. Okay. Thank Great. You, That's very nice. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Well, thank you both. Okay. We'll thank move you. on now to item 12. And this is discuss and possibly approve a proposed encampment policy. So, Colin, you're going to take us through that. Absolutely. Good evening, uh, Colin McNeil, City Attorney. Um, at your request, we brought forward a well, the document that you have in your packet, um, policies and procedures relating to encampments, um, and you consider it for the first time on, on November 21st. Uh, during that meeting, uh, we took some public comment and had some discussion. The largest takeaway we took from that was that um, in instances of um, a situation where um, a campsite is removed and the city is storing personal property. Um, the original draft of that, of this policy, uh, included that we would store that property for a week. 
uh, based on the comments and discussions we've on uh, the draft that's now before you we've increased that to 30 days um, also since the the november uh, 21st when we when you first reviewed this we've met with community outreach um, and got some in, input back from them we also met with the public department of public works to see you know citywide if this could actually be a workable policy uh, community outreach gave us some comments which are reflected in your uh, the documents in your packet one we gave you a red line version and, and a clean version um, community outreach really uh, um, highlighted that instead of offering alternative shelter because the shelter does not belong to us it's more identifying uh, shelters that um, at that request uh, law enforcement uh, can go with them uh, when they're um, meeting with people who are in encampments um, and also that the notice that we provide is subject to the rules of the uh, shelters that we're, we're notifying people about just in certain instances that that we were aware community outreach highlighted some situations for instance with the hotel voucher program uh, that sometimes when you're offered a hotel voucher it's a yes or no at that point and if you refuse it um, it's going to go to the next person in line and then you go to the bottom of the list so it's um, it's not a window of a period where this where that option is available to you in, in some instances it's, it's a here's here's an option for a place to go um, at the state's expense or the at the government's expense, and, and you have to say yes or no. So um, those are the changes that, that we made to the policy document that's in front of you. Um, we have been made aware that there's some, um, have been some questions raised about whether a policy is appropriate or whether an ordinance is appropriate. Uh, just for things to think about is, is one that the, uh, you're, you'll be aware that um, from our last meeting, we based our policy largely on what Portland, Maine had done. They based it largely on what Tacoma, Washington had done. Both of those communities operate with a, with a policy, um, with an ordinance similar to ours. I understand that um, thou shall not camp here with a policy to, to how to administer that. Uh, that seems to be by talking to those, those communities, or at least the Portland community who represented what Tacoma had told them, the policies that they've adopted seem to be working well in their communities um, in the structure, similar structure that, that we've adopted. Um, and I, I believe that as far as I know, uh, locally, that um, although Burlington has talked about implementing an ordinance or adopting an ordinance, they'll start, they'll still, they are still operating with a policy uh, and not an, have not yet passed an ordinance. Um, I think it might be in, in committee somewhere. Uh, there was talk of, of adopting an ordinance. Um, so that's one reason. Uh, another reason is that if you have a policy, you can, you can adopt it now. Um, it doesn't require first reading, a second reading. The public hearing that requires an, or that an ordinance does require. Um, you can really put this in place. Um, this is a, uh, a new idea for the city, so it's going to have some kinks potentially. Um, it's a lot of words to, to implement and, and put through with a lot of workmanship between the, the various departments, like the police department, the public works department, how it works out. A policy allows us to have some flexibility. Uh, if something's not working, we can come to you in a meeting and say, this isn't working, can we change it? Um, and you could change it right there. Um, that would be different than what's included in ordinance where if you're going to change it, you need to go through all the steps that are that are called for in the statutes. And uh, Colin, if I could just pause you there for a quick second. I would just remind the council that this, this um, came about, this was something that had been on your priorities and strategies uh, for about, well, since we, about 18 months and came to the top of your agenda because of an emerging issue. So we were trying to be very nimble to an immediate community need. Um, a policy is the quickest way to get there and protect the liability of the city and, and, and mostly respect, primarily respect our residents. Um, and that's partially why the policy, we identify the policy as the best course forward and allows us to try something new and change it quickly on the fly to both be, um, responsive to what the staff needs, but also more importantly to what our residents need. Excellent. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and the, the, maybe the fourth reason I would give is that generally um, with, with the document that's in front of you, you're, you're essentially directing staff how you'd like them to act. It is focused on city staff. Um, and that's generally what policies do. You're looking internally with a policy to tell uh, the people that work for the city how you want them to behave and how you want them to act. With an ordinance, it's more outfacing, um, just generally. You're telling the community at large, this is what our laws are in our community, and this is what we expect from everyone, as opposed to, um, so just generally speaking, because this looks inward, um, that's why we came up with a policy instead of a, a set of an ordinance. Um, so um, that's essentially it for now. I mean, I can walk through the, the policy again if you, if you would like just some general 
outlines, but it's um, with those minor changes, it's the, it's the policy that you looked at uh, on November 21st. I, I don't think you need to walk through it unless someone, I mean, maybe someone wants to specifically hear about um, a particular issue. I, um, I mean, Peter Taylor raised with me and sent, I think all of us, an email. Or did you just send it to me, Peter? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, concerned about the impact um, or how you carry this out in the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if, Peter, do you want to just briefly describe, because he's a sexton and chairs that committee. Um, can you share your concerns and then maybe Colin, you can either address them like it's covered here or we can think about um, sure. adjusting it a little bit. Thank, Thank you me. very much. As you know, uh, we city has two cemeteries, Eldridge over by the airport and Shelburne Road. Shelburne Road had, I think, three tents removed in the spring, early summer, and two cars were using it this fall as a place to overnight and park um in so the parking the, lot or in the no in actual the back, cemetery driving all the way to the back of the cemetery and parking way in the back uh -huh. uh, where we clean brush to kind of open it up a little bit um it, as i read the policy and this may be an old one not the new one but you have emphasis areas and i think 7.2 talks about emphasis areas and um I guess I'd suggest you add cemeteries in there so it's clearly known that uh, campsites in cemeteries can be removed regardless of any other conditions. Maybe in the last line where it says uh, uh, special concern including schools, playgrounds, facilities for the elderly or cemeteries or in cemeteries. I think that would do it. I, I'm just concerned that it, Chilmer Road's a nice place to put a tent up, mm -hmm. uh, and it's tucked in the back, and there's curb cut, and you can drive in there, and uh, and I think it's inappropriate for people to be living in there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. particularly with the efforts we put in to spruce it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Clarification. The language doesn't specifically um, exclude cemeteries in any way at this point in time, right? Right. You you would just want to add that to like part of the emphasis description. I I'm thinking. I mean, to. help me out. I, does that accomplish what I want to do? I just want it clear that cemeteries are part of an the emphasis, rather than just leaving it open, that it. If it's not specified in here, I think it should be. All city-owned land is governed would be governed by this policy, right? Yeah. Right. So that includes cemeteries and parks. Yeah, but a lot of people may not know that a cemetery is city land. I mean, a lot of them are specific religions that I I, I don't know yeah. who owns them, but but all city land is covered by this. Mm -hmm. But emphasis areas say that you can remove encampments regardless of any other conditions from emphasis areas. And that's why I think cemeteries should be included in that, that section. Colin, can you comment on that? I, I, I can. I, I think that um, Councilor Barrett has, has raised uh, somewhat of a point that this covers all city property. It doesn't specifically mention uh, cemeteries as as written, um, but it, it could if um, if it uh, the way it, you know the way a pol the policy would work into place is if an area becomes an area where campsites are existent and that have become a problem, those could be identified as emphasis areas that could be posted. Um, a cemetery could work in the same way if it if it has become an an, an area that uh, campsites have arisen that have become a problem. I think that um, 
what is being requested is there's this section seven, which talks about campsite removal prioritization, um, which identifies um, the removal of campsites may be prioritized after an inspection of campsite locations by city personnel. Um, so based on certain impacts, it, 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 we could add cemeteries to the list at the bottom of 7.2. Um, and uses of special concern, including schools, playgrounds, or facilities for the elderly. Um, a cemetery could certainly be in there for, a, for an area that would be looked at as a, as a priority to, to focus on if, if they become problems. And living in a car would, would constitute a campsite. Yeah, I mean, I think we'd have to... I mean, that yes. was your experience. These people were yeah, they living in their cars. They literally driving have during the tent. day and parking one car and traveling in the other one, coming back at night, yes. going someplace else, and then coming back a few days later. Sleeping in the car at night. Yeah. Cemetery, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that covered with the language that we have? I mean, they talk about tents and, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think we could, it doesn't, you know, as I'm looking at it, it, it does talk about tent, lean-to structure, tarp, pallet, or makeshift structure used for purposes of habitation located in an identifiable, identifiable area. If someone's using a vehicle, I believe it could fall under that defi okay. definition. Okay, as long as that's covered, that's fine. I'll, yeah, I'll just add, you know, I, I don't know anything uh, about what I'm going to say other than what I've seen, which is people sitting in electrical vehicles and plugged in for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, but sitting in the vehicle, um, you know, and I leave here at night and they're sitting in the vehicle. So I don't come back to know what's going, but I, and it, just as another, I see all of the affordable housing people here and thank you, um, is this morning on the radio, they were talking about, and I wish I could go back and listen again, um, a city in California um, you know, that instead of paying much more on police, fire, hospital, um, and all different kinds of services, they provide, you know, $600 a month to someone to be able to stay in their house, which adds up to a lot less than police, fire, hospital, and all of these different services. Um, and the apparently President Biden's administration is looking into it, so it might not be a local solution. But I, I just it's curious. I'm curious to know where are these people, you know, what their history is. Did they live here in Vermont and they couldn't pay their property tax or they couldn't pay their rent or they? It would just be. I think, you know, I'm just I'm speaking to the affordable housing committee people as well, um, and to know exactly. You know, I know that there are, are apartments here on this street as well as in the new um, two buildings, the so one building, sorry, over in the um, hillside that are going to also have units for, for homeless. And I just, I'd, I'd really like to understand, you know, just like, you know, the, the traffic lights, the, the radars are there. It's much more economical for us to put up a radar and saying you're going over the speed limit as opposed to having a police officer sitting there and enforcing the speed limit, right? Because people enforce themselves when they see, ah, oh, I'm going 10 miles over the speed limit. I better, I better, you know, take it down. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, something that other countries do. And I know that in this country, it can be anathema to some people to think that we'd help people actually stay in their homes. But when we think about paying for police and fire and hospital and all these other services, um, the public is paying much, much more. So anyway, I just thought I'd raise that and um, and just let you know, I don't know You're what's happening. Yeah, I don't okay. know what's happening in our parking lot <laughs> overnight. Um, <laughs> and And I also think to Peter's point, the way I read it, I, I would add cemeteries, and I realize that that means that we have to come back to another meeting to approve this policy. Um, no, we don't. No, we don't. We, oh, we could, can just we could approve it with that amendment. We could amend yeah. it, the policy. Okay, could amend cool. it, or we, you know, you have a couple different options. We're you could already just, you, amending it. You could approve it, yeah. it as is, um, and then we could look at how the how to best place cemeteries in here, uh, and come back to you, and you could amend it next time. We could amend it on the fly right now, uh, and you could approve that. Um, mm -hmm. So a couple different options that you have at this point. Mm -hmm. Because there, there is, we have some uh, 
<laughs> responsibilities was kind of my my understanding having worked with the sextons this past summer we have responsibilities as a community with regard to how cemeteries are are upkept and so it makes sense um okay Tom? So yeah, I, I'm not opposed to the cemetery language, uh, but I, I'd love to consider that at a future future meeting. And I appreciate that you spoke right off the bat to the difference between the ordinance and the policy. Um, so the council approving tonight this policy, since it's a new policy so that we can get some experience with it, is not saying we, we don't support looking at making it an ordinance in the future. So I support having this be a policy tonight, and I also support looking at this becoming an ordinance when we get more comfortable with it over the coming year. Uh, so that's where I'd be on moving this forward. Okay. Are you opposed to inserting cemeteries in 7.2 as like, um, I don't know where it goes, but at the end. Prioritizing. Yeah. yeah okay. Including schools, playgrounds, cemeteries, or facilities for the elderly. Just inserting cemetery. I mean, I don't think we need to come back to see it printed. Really right. good. Okay, yeah. is that amenable to everyone? That's okay. Fine. Yeah. I, uh, I, further comment? I just want to say I, I I appreciate the work that went into this um, and the fact that you that it was pulled together from from other communities that have have, have uh, faced the same challenge and it's it's respectful. Uh, it provides for alternative um, uh, places for people to live if they're available at that time, but it also seeks to to strike that balance between um, people who live, uh, you know, next to city land where somebody's encamped and there are uh, some hazards, you know, related to that. So um, I think this is a good place to start mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. work from here. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the other aspect that we spoke about last time is that um, it, the intent of this is not to criminalize encampments or, or houselessness or homelessness. It's really to find alternative placements for people and use the resources that we have to to find shelters for people that are um, if, it, if it becomes a problem in the city not on city land okay. okay Sandy you wanted to make a comment Sandy Dooley and I'm not speaking as a member of the affordable housing committee I'm speaking as someone who's lived in this city for 50 years. Um, first, I want to thank you for changing the period that people can retrieve their property from a week to 30 days. Um, the thing I wanted to emphasize is that, I, from my perception, it's the level of protection that you're offering to people who whose only home is an encampment. They are essentially without conventional housing. Um, and um, I, one of the things we've been looking at is, uh, is what we want to have in the housing chapter, comprehensive plan, and there's no mention of people without housing in it now. And I had looked at actually Portland, Maine's um, comp plan, and it talked about homelessness and so I'll just mention in response to Megan's question is that a high proportion at least in Portland are people with serious sub substance abuse problems and mm -hmm. and many have mental health um, challenges and many have both um, so um, that's probably what you'll find out um, here in Burlington too and the other thing I would just mention is um, this issue of people, um, to a certain degree, finding themselves without housing is, is a product of our housing crisis and not having enough housing, especially <coughs> not enough affordable housing. And also, I do think the opiate crisis and our um, much greater challenge uh, relating to that uh, has exacerbated the problem. But what I just wanted to say is, I think of the level of protection that people have depending on their circumstances. I, as a, a person who lives in a house, happens to be a homeowner, or if I rented, if the police wanted to enter my home, 
without my permission, they would have to have a search warrant. And in order to have a search warrant, they would have to prepare um, the reasoning why they needed to, to search that um, my home. And they'd have to get a judge to approve it. So I, fortunate me, who is not without housing, has the protection of two branches of government, the executive branch, police, and the courts. Um, but if I were homeless, um, that's why I think an ordinance is appropriate because you have no protection of the law without an ordinance in terms of if something goes wrong. And in terms of justice and equity, I, I believe that an ordinance is the uh, appropriate way to um, the context within which these procedures should be adopted. I do like um, Tom's suggestion of having the policy now and then moving toward an ordinance. In terms of frequency of change, I'd be interested in how often the cities you communicated needed to um, amend their policies. But um, I also, while I'll have to research, I generally rely on the accuracy of BT Jigger, but they said that the Burlington City Council had adopted an ordinance in February uh, because the court had said that a policy had no standing and nobody could go to court on the basis of a policy to seek to have some redress or court intervention if they found that the uh, policy hadn't, the procedures had not been accurately, um, uh, well, there it was the attempt to um, operationalize them. So I guess I, you know, that's where I see it. It's, it's what level of protection does someone get in this society, in this community for their home? Whether that home is an encampment or if it's somebody's house. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd rather spend $600 a month to let them stay in a house with four walls and heating rather than have them give have access to our court system. Um, I think there's availability of $600 if there's housing for them, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I agree with you. But sometimes they have to leave their house because they can't afford. And... It's coming back a little bit, but it's people who are coming, you know, who are transitioning out of prison or out of foster homes, um, that they tend to be very vulnerable. And there was a third category that I can't remember. Um, Domestic violence, probably. I wasn't on this morning's report, but I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, that we're not going to solve all that with this policy no. change. But no. we are potentially going to give the, the police and first-line um, mental health workers um, a framework um, for how we wish them to treat these individuals and how you go about mm -hmm. um, getting them to a safer place to live. I mean, it is safety for them, too. I don't think these encampments are... Um, uh, particularly safe environment, right? From what I've read, right? I mean, maybe the couple living in their cars—that's different. It's just the two of them, but they're still subject to, you know, potential violence or somebody else um, hurting them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it looks like we have one more person who would like to speak, and then I'd like to, if that's if no one else at home, then I'd like us to. Um, move on this with those amendments. Thank you. Uh, Chris Trumbly, 16 Dubois, um, speaking as a uh, resident, not a member of the uh, Affordable Housing Committee. Um, I just wanted to share this snippet from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Um, homeless encampments are highly visible and troubling reminders of the housing crisis in our country. Encampments occur because there's a pervasive lack of affordable permanent housing in our communities. Um, the city council has made some uh, great 
um, progress towards uh, helping uh, in in that uh, area for South Burlington, whether that's um, some of the uh, cost units at Summit Properties or um, some of the ARPA investment they've made on uh, Williston Road. So thank you for those contributions. Um, this is going to be something I think Sandy alluded to that uh, we didn't see it uh, captured in the comp plan. So it's uh, we're particularly, um, I think, as a community focused on the point in time survey that's going to come out in January and kind of really understand, like, how bad is, has this um, developed? And uh, with VRAP money expiring um, and folks, uh, you know, there's some, some anxiety about um, how am I going to afford a place to live and having that stable housing helps them avoid being a person who's experiencing homelessness. When I attended the um, the housing conference, a uh, speaker um, clarified that it's, it, you know, you're not talking about homeless people, it's people experiencing homelessness. It's it's a point in time. They've, maybe they've fallen into a situation where they fell into that and, you know, they didn't have that support structure that I think mm -hmm. um, Megan was trying to articulate. And just that housing is the, is that stability piece. Um, so look forward to uh, future collaboration. I would like to see this evolve into an ordinance. Um, the difference between a policy is, sounds like it's the right time to get something uh, moving forward. Uh, but thank you, um, Senator Chitton, for uh, expressing support for a future ordinance. That's um, having protections for folks who, there's nobody else here to speak for them. And um, you know, it's not very often you see um, somebody experiencing homelessness, whether it's a UVM student living in their car, um, or it's, uh, you know, um, somebody who's fallen on a rough time, they got nowhere else to go. Um, sometimes they don't know where to go. So um, thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, so Noah Hyman would like to speak. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to take a moment to thank everyone for making so much time and putting so much energy into this. Um, since um, um, the orientation for me in the State House, I've started to get uh, emails now from people, and I'm actually getting a lot of emails about people who are about to experience homelessness or are trying. Uh, to negotiate, to be able to stay in their homes. Um, I'm reaching out to um, Vermont legal assistance programs, trying to get people help. Um, it's just, it's a very important thing. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for um, putting it in the forefront here. That's all. Thank you. So are we ready to um, adopt this policy with the one additional um, uh, wording to include cemeteries in the list of places of emphasis. I'll move to approve the proposed encampment policy with the addition of the uh, cemeteries in uh, section 7.2. Second. Okay. You ready for the vote? Yes. Okay. All in favor signify by saying yes. 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 So the um, policy is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, item 13, continued first reading on a, another ordinance to implement education impact fees and set a public hearing for a special meeting on January 23rd at 6.30 p.m. So we have Paul Connor and we are overworking Colin. <laughs> Just enough, right? I'm here already. It's great. He's earning his keep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Howdy, folks. Um, so, as discussed last month, um, you uh, asked us to make a couple of changes to the uh, draft before you warned a public hearing. Um, those are incorporated in here. Those include a few typo corrections. Um, clarifying or being um, stating that affordable housing as defined in the city's land development regulations is exempt. And um, the council wanted to see an adjustment to the way in which um, any administrative fees are recouped. And so um, 
staff's proposal in there would be to replace what was the 4% of the school impact fees with a straight $100 per permit, um, which uh, would apply to any individual permit, whether it's for a commercial building or a single family home or a multiplex just across the board to cover the administrative costs. And potentially, uh, it would be eligible for um, funding future amendments to the impact fee ordinance, though it's not a huge dollar amount that would be brought in, so it's more likely to cover most of the administrative costs. So, Just a, one clarification. So it's, it's $100 for any... Um, Right, so that would be a proposed permit. change that, well, any permit that would trigger the use of impact fees. So if you're getting okay, a deck, right. so we have then several. you wouldn't be doing, okay. you, you wouldn't, most of the permits that we issued don't trigger the use of impact right. fees. Okay. So what would trigger the use of impact fees would be an expansion to a building um, or additional, um, or in the commercial side, a change of use that created more trips. So if okay. you went from. So uh, this $100 does not um, doesn't get attached to the school impact fee or any other fee. It helps fund your department. It well, it's not necessarily our department because a lot of the cost is borne citywide, so it winds up being in the finance side. Okay. Um, and the communication back and forth to school, so it it you know goes to the general revenues, but it's an acknowledgement as. Uh, uh, as Jesse was describing at the last meeting, that right. there is okay. an expense to the city for doing it. You could choose, if you like, to apply it just to the school impact fee um, for the administrative costs of that. But um, what we propose is that it applies to anything triggering anything. impact okay. fees. Any impact fee. Anything Any impact triggering fee. an impact yeah. fee. Yeah, yes. whether it's yep. police or school or whatever. I, yes. Just by way of introduction, sorry, I should have said that. We're in the beginning. Jonathan Slayson from RSG is on line, as is Tim Jarvis. The superintendent is not available tonight, but Tim is here on her, in her stead if you have questions for them as well. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from anyone? All right. So I guess I would entertain a motion to set a special hearing on January 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Um, to at six thirty. Uh, that's what it says. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Could I so that comment on that? Do you want to change it? No, I want. It. So this is a special council meeting. This is the night of the steering committee meeting where we pass budgets back and forth. So the idea here is that you would hold a special council meeting for the sole purpose of this public hearing and possible action on this ordinance. Um, immediately before you held, held the steering committee with the school board. Oh. So the advantage of that is the school board would also be here. It's an educational thing. Um, and you would right. do no other business that night other than those two things. So that that's the motion we want. <laughs> so moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? You ready? Okay, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Good job, Tim. He's a troublemaker. Tim. He is. Okay. Uh, number 14, um, opportunity for counselors and the public to share information and resource, resources on climate change. Any update? All right. Any other business? <sighs> Always making a mess. <laughs> So um, I would entertain then a motion that Tim is going to read um, about a executive session to discuss pending litigation. So I have a motion. <clears throat> I move that the council make a specific finding that premature general public knowledge of a discussion of pending civil litigation to which the public body is a party would clearly place this public body at a substantial disadvantage. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So I now move that the board enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing discussing pending civil litigation to which the public body is a party. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And we will not be coming back into session. Oh, we didn't invite anybody. Uh, bringing into, I'm sorry, uh, Jesse Baker, Colin McNeil, Amanda Lafferty, and Paul Connor. I'll be 
Yeah. <laughs> One more thing to sign. Yes. All agreeable? Yes. Aye. Okay. Thank you.